This is Alsha Khan on November 2nd, 2013 at the office of Richard Moya in Austin, Texas. This project is entitled The Voting Rights Oral History Project, part of the VOSIS Oral History Project. Thank you, Richard, for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, so we're going to start with your childhood from the very beginning. You were born in Austin, Texas to Bertha and Pete Moya in 1932. Um, you grew up predominant in a predominantly Hispanic East Austin. What was it like growing up there? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know exactly what you mean, but I, I think we just kind of grew up in that barrio. You know, we most of us were his, in fact, all of us were Hispanic, and we lived, uh, you know, about two blocks from Savala Elementary, so we hung around the school all the time, and uh, we didn't have a playground, so we just played in the street. And I always tell people this story that we were the happiest people in the world when they built a public housing project at uh, Santa Rita Courts in 1938 because they had a playground and we didn't. So we just kind of make friends with them and go over there and play in their playground. And uh, But um, there wasn't much going on in those days for kids, uh, you know, just kind of play in the street or, you know, stay home. Certainly there was no TV to watch. and. Um, so we just spent a lot of time uh, at home. And what was it like at Zavala, since it was the, the quote, Mexican elementary school? Well, you know, Zavala was, uh, um, you know, I didn't know it then, but, um, you know, found out later, figured out part of it on my own, that Zavala w was a very new school compared to Metz. Metz was a few blocks away. But what we figured out after time that they built Savala because they didn't want the Mexicans to go to Mets. So what they did, they did what's very unusual. It's not done at AISD now. They, uh, the district for that school, for Savala, was the same that the district was for Mets. It was identical boundaries, in other words. And so, and the way they did it, they, if you were Mexican, you went to Savala, and if you were an Anglo, you went to Mets. And if, you, if an Anglo happened to live across the street from you, he'd have to hustle over to Mets every morning because they wouldn't let him go to Zavala, and vice versa. And that went on, that went on all the way through, I guess, till after World War II ended. In '45, I guess, they, there was a little bit more of a rebellion against that kind of stuff. Um, speaking of that kind of rebellion, um, you moved closer to the, what was called the white school of Matt's elementary, and your mother, but you were expected to go to Zavala. Oh so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the story. The story there is that my mom uh, wasn't thinking about discrimination or anything. She was just thinking common sense that why did, I, did my sister and I have to walk in front of Mets to get to Zavala? It didn't make any sense to her. So she, um, she was the, she was pretty much a hellraiser, really, and so she she went all the way to the superintendents and argued with them about it. And I guess uh, I really don't know this, but I guess they just got tired of her going over there, and they let my sister and I go to Mets. But there was only five of us there. I'll never forget them. I, I'll, their names I can I can give them to you all the time. It was me, my sister Christine, a lady named Irene Adams, and a boy named Lee Adams and Roland Benavides, and we figured Roland got to go there because his daddy was a janitor, so he got to go to school there. But in the mornings, we get to school early, you kind of play around the, in the playground until the bell rings. A bunch of, of, of Mexican kids were playing with us out there in the playground. They were from Haskell and Riverview and that those streets down there close to the river. And uh, the minute the bell rang in, at Zavala, I mean at Mets, they knew the bell was ringing at Zavala, so they'd take off running so they wouldn't be late to school, but they would not let them go to school with them. We never quite understood that at that age, but do you know, after time we did. So what was it like, how different was it at Metz when you moved over? How, what? how different was it at Metz? Well, it, you know, we weren't treated very nice, um, especially by some of those teachers, but uh, the worst thing about, about going to Metz for me was that uh, you know, in elementary school, I don't know about now, but in those days they used to have what they called a little recess, which was kind of a break of about 10 or 15 minutes. You go outside and play and then the bell rings, you run back in. 
Well, my sister and I, we didn't go outside for a little recess. We stayed in the classroom because it was kind of bad out there for you. There was a lot of, they pick on you and they try to get you to fight and stuff. And you know, we, we kind of said, well, you can't win. You couldn't win. We were tremendously outnumbered, so it wouldn't make any difference if we did go. So we just stayed inside. So I'm, I tell everybody as I grew up there, I'm one, of the, I'm one of the few kids that hated little recess in elementary school because I didn't want to go outside for obvious reasons. So um, would you say that Austin itself was segregated? Oh yeah, the schools were, the schools were. And uh, uh, when I got to, when I got to uh, what they call middle school now, when I got to the junior high and high school, they, they, they did allow us to go there, but uh, you know, the African Americans weren't allowed to go there. And so obviously it was segregated. So they weren't allowed to go to your middle school? No. Okay. Or to high school. And were Mexican Americans segregated to East Austin at that time? Were there a lot of them? Mm -hmm. In East Austin. Were they segregated to East Austin? Well, they were, even by neighborhoods. You know, kind of, you know, this street that we now call Cesar Chavez was, was called East First in those days. And the majority of the, uh, the Hispanic families lived uh, what I call. Uh, uh, north, north of East First, and the Anglos lived south of East First, and and the real, real, real poor Hispanic family, Mexican families, they lived on Riverview Street, which is an undesirable part of town. Not anymore, but it was then. And um, backing up to Zavala, um, did you did you ask your mom to go to Zavala since you're discriminated against at Matt? Did I ask her to go? To Zavala. What do you mean, to go? You said that you didn't like going to Mets. No, I, no, I didn't like it. No, I didn't like it, but you know, we, uh, mom, mom felt that uh, we should go there because we live, you know, two blocks from there. You didn't ask her if you could go back to No, Zavala. but, uh, uh, no, I did not ask her, but I, I couldn't have gone there. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> has that has the dem have the demographics changed of Austin? You said you said that there's seg Mexican Americans were segregated to East Austin, on Riverview, and ha has that changed? Well, the neighborhoods have changed a little bit, but uh, and, and I think you know at, at that time you know Austin wasn't very big, so the, therefore the Hispanic population wasn't that large either, and uh, we were kind of more clannish than we are now. We all try to live, you know close to each other. I think we all knew each other. And it's certainly the adults all knew each other and uh, they, you know, they, they got together every Saturday night and had a party in the, in the vodka and, and it was kind of traditional. Uh, uh, have they changed? Of course, yeah, of course they changed. I mean, uh, there's still a, uh, you know, like East Austin, what I said, most of it was Hispanic. It's not that way now and it's getting, it's getting it's getting gentrified even more and more now, and uh, and it's it's a big problem. But I don't know. It seems to me very little you can do about it. Uh, what's happening uh, as everybody that keeps up with this stuff knows that uh, what happened to the people that have stayed in East Austin through generations, you know, uh, they live in this little old house and they own it. They probably don't don't have any mortgage payments, but uh, but they can't afford to live there anymore because of the people that are coming in have a lot more money than they have. They buy a house, they knock it down, they build a three-story house, and next year this poor little old man has been living there in this little old house, can't even, can't afford the taxes because they go up. So it's a problem, and but I, yeah, you know, and I think what's happening, and I do a lot of political stuff, they're moving to the fringes. They're moving out to Del Valley and other places uh, where, the rent, where rent or ownership is possible, but it's, you know, they're little houses and they can afford those. That's too bad because some of, some actually, some of these people actually want to die there because that, that their home has been, it was their daddy's home, now it's their home and you know. and uh, But that's not gonna work out very well because it's not gonna be long before none of them can afford to live there. So it, it's gonna change, it's gonna change. But you know, I, I tell people, we changed it for them too. You know, when I'm telling you about people living on Willow and Canterbury and Garden was predominantly Anglo. Uh, after we we moved over there in 41, um, it still was predominantly Anglo, 
Well, I mean, about 10 years after that, or 15 years after that, he was predominantly Hispanic. It changed. And all this over here was all Hispanic. Well, now, after all these years, now it's changing back again. But now it's changing back to an Anglo um, um, population, but it, it, it's a different kind of Anglo. It, it's, a, it's an Anglo, you know, I know a lot of folks over there, there are Anglos over here, and most of them are from California or somewhere. They're not, they're not from Texas. Uh, they're young people, and they don't. They they're not prejudiced people. They they don't care. They you know they, 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 they it's a different mentality, which it's good, but it, they are changing the neighborhood now. But I was telling some people the other day, I put I predict Go Valley is next for gentrification. They haven't quite infiltrated that one yet, but they will. I'm I'm gonna back up to your childhood again, and um, could you tell us a little about your parents? who they were, sure. just a little about your mother and father? Sure. Well, uh, my dad uh, was born, I'd say San Antonio, but actually he was born in a, in a ranch called, uh, in Von Army, Texas, which is the other side of off, uh, San Antonio, like it's on the highway if you go into Laredo, say. Uh, he, uh, my dad, when, when he was about six years old, his mom and dad died. Uh, about six months apart, and there was nine of them in the family. What traditional was it, with Mexican American families in those days uh, was that when something like that happened, that, that usually whoever baptized you was responsible for you. If something happened to the parents, and uh, so what happened to was my brother's, her, his brother's sister, which was nine of them, eight, well eight of them, uh, they all went in different directions. Uh, so my dad got uh, ended up with with a, um, a guy that was had baptized him, but was kind of a second cousin or something. So he took him, and they they, they were tenant farmers in Von Army at a peanut farm. So my dad went over there with them when he was about six years old, and uh, and so he worked in a peanut farm, and consequently, he never went to school one day in his life. And nobody in that group in there in Von Army went to school one day in their lives. So, you know, he grew up not being able to read and write at all. He, he learned how to sign his name. And uh, like I was telling you earlier, I never figured out how he was, he was great at math. He was terrific at math. I don't know how he did that. And the streets, uh, I don't know how he did that either because he couldn't read, but he memorized the names, I guess. So I could think, he would say, let's go to Canterbury Street. And, how does he know what kind of bear he is? He can't read, but uh, he did. And that's my dad, and so he, being unable to read and write made it really difficult to try to get a job, you know? So he um, became a, a um, independent um, ice carrier. So what he did, he, uh, he, he so knocked, he'd go by, he told me the story that, he, that when he started the ice route, as we called it, um, that he borrowed 80 cents from one of my, my, mother, my mother's brothers. He bought him, borrowed 80 cents and went and bought 80 cents for his eyes. And he put it in this little pickup and covered it up with, with like a blanket, you know. And uh, he went knocking on doors. And he sold, sold the eyes. And, you know, from there he grew into them. At one time during the war, I remember it, but during the war, ice was rationed. And my daddy's limit was 14,000 pounds. That's all he could buy. And, I, and we sold them all, he sold them all. And so he'd go door to door, he had regular customers, he gave them credit. If you didn't give credit in those days, you, you wouldn't have any customers. Because the people that were working, they didn't get paid but once a week, and they just lived, you know, week to week, really. Uh, and if they lost their job that week, you, you weren't gonna get paid for your eyes, but that seemed to be all right with Dad, he, he understood that. But, so he made a living selling ice in the summer, and in the winter, he sold wood to those same customers. And uh, and he made a living, he raised three of us. Uh, he um, he was a lot smarter than me because uh, I don't own any real estate except the house I live in. Well, my dad would go around buying these little houses and fixing them up or renting them out. And, and when he died, he, he owned about 10 houses, right, all over here, all over here on in the east side. And so he, he was able to raise his family with that. You know, he raced all three of them, and, uh, and he did all right, but uh, he's kind of a success story. 
And why did people buy ice from him? Well, because, it, well, in those days, uh, there, there's no such thing as refrigerators. And uh, if there were any, and I don't know if there were, I mean, no, nobody living over here could afford one. So they, they bought those little ice boxes and you put the ice in there. I remember delivering the ice. And, uh, it was, you go in there, the ice had melted down. The people had put everything they wanted to keep from melting on top of the ice. So I had to take everything out of the, out of the ice box, lay it on the table, put the new ice in there, put the old ice on top of it, and then try to fit, fit all that food back in there. And, and, and sometimes it wouldn't fit because they had melted way down and they had put everything you could think of. But I made a lot of friends that way. And, you know, they feed me. One of them would leave me a banana. One of them would leave me something. <laughs> but it was kind of fun. And, uh, and, and I enjoyed doing it. Um, and in the winter, I couldn't do much of that wood stuff. That was kind of heavy stuff. But, uh, he, but we, had a, we had a phone. People call in. They needed some wood. So we, they throw it in the truck and go deliver it. It was kind of interesting <laughs> business. And so you sold wood in the winter. Huh? He sold wood in the winter. Yeah, winter, yeah. For and the office. Ice in the summer, yeah. And your mother? My mom uh, went to school a little bit more. She go. She said she went to about the seventh grade. And uh, so she was the one that, you know, could write the checks and do that kind of stuff. And, uh, but she never worked after she married Dad. She, she never worked again. She, you know, uh, we, uh, she stayed home. We did have a, we did have, when we moved to Buena Vista there on Santa Maria, uh, uh, my dad thought it would be a good idea to, uh, to add a, a room to the house, to the front, and connect it to the kitchen, and he, we opened a little grocery store, and mother ran the store, but the way she ran it was that she uh, had a bell on the front door of the store, and she'd be over in the kitchen doing whatever, and when somebody came in, the bell rang, she'd go over there and wait on them. And, uh, so we made a little money, I guess, that way, selling groceries and uh, just, you know, just barely necessities. We didn't have no big old grocery store, but we had milk and bread and candy and stuff like that. And uh, so she did that, ran the store and took care of us and uh, uh, raised us. And, and in those days, you know, he cooked three meals a day and, uh, she, you know, in those days, it was traditional. You had the three meals a day. It's not like it is now in some families, you know. Uh, and we had breakfast at a regular time, and uh, and then we off to school. And lunch, same thing. And then for dinner, same old deal. A lot of a lot of hamburger meat with with rice and beans. Pretty good. <laughs> what was the name of the grocery store? It just like Moya Moya Grocery or something. And um, what was a typical day like, aside from your meals, when you oh, were growing Well, up? we went to school, but uh, we would go to school and, and uh, come back about when school was out, and Mom might have some chores for us to do, or Dad might want to take me with him wherever he was going. I, I kind of ran around with him all the time, and, and uh, I told you earlier, in order to get through that ice ride earlier, I was driving that pickup when I was about 12 years old. I'd drive the pickup because you was going from house, you know, from house to house. No big deal, but by him not having to drive the truck, he could go faster because he had to get. He just go to the next house and he'd get out and go. And sometimes he'd hire a young, a young person to help him to deliver the ice because it was a little too much. And as he got older, but all that came to an end when the war, when the war ended in '45. Here come these refrigerators, and um, so then he had to, he couldn't do that anymore. I mean, he wasn't profitable anymore. So he just kind of worked at the, he worked at the, uh, at the ice house where they made the ice, till they went out of business because they, everybody, in fact the guy that sold the ice ended up selling refrigerators. <laughs> he did, he saw the handwriting on the wall. So finally, my dad did get a job um, at the, um, in, at the abattoir, what we call in Spanish La Matanza. So he worked at slaughterhouse where they slaughter the animals. So he got a job there. One of the neighbors told him about there was a job opening over there and, and you know, he could do that and so he, he went over there and he worked over there rounding up cows and killing them. You know how they killed him in those days? I, I couldn't believe it. I went over there one day and I never wanted to go again. They hit him, they hit him on the head with a big old hammer. 
And, uh, and but let me tell you a good thing about working there. A lot of our neighbors worked at La Matanza, as they call it, the slaughterhouse or abattoir, it's the proper name, I guess. And in those days, um, they didn't know they didn't know what to do with all that fajita meat, all the meat they get off your ribs. So they threw it away. Well, not to our neighbors they didn't throw it away. Our neighbors <laughs> brought it home, and they we all ate fajitas all the time. <laughs> and, and uh, because now you now it's I don't know five six dollars a pound, but they didn't know it. It's a, it, a real fajita is the meat that you scrape off, you cut off from the ribs. Now you know they got they they've uh, anglicized for lack of a better word fajita. Now they got trim fajita, chicken fajitas. You know there's no such thing, but that's what it works for them. And um, when you went into high school, what was that like? Was Allen you went to Allen High School? I went to Austin High School. Or I, Austin, sorry, Austin High School. And um, was that any different? Was that what? Was were you discriminated against? Oh yeah, there? sure. We didn't. We didn't. Uh, we had our own little group. We kind of we we hung around together. In fact, uh, 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 we just we would meet in the mornings. All we all meet in the in one of the cafeterias. In early in the morning, all of us. And uh, and this is. Uh, and so what I did when I was in high school, we couldn't get, you know, they had this newspaper called the Austin Maroon or whatever. And, uh, but they never would say anything about any anything we did. So uh, me and two other guys, Sam Guerra and Raymond Montevais, uh, and we used to hang around Pan Am, and we noticed that Pan Am, that, that the director had one of these mimeograph machines, and uh, they cut a stencil, you put it on, and you turn it to me. So we said, well, we're going to start our own newspaper. The heck was this Austin Maroon? So we started one, and it came out every Friday morning. And we call it the Blah, Blah, and Blah. And we just had more fun with that deal. And finally, it got so bad that they banned it from the school. <laughs> they told us we couldn't distribute it anymore. And all we did was do silly stuff. Like if you were, if you were going around with somebody and you broke up, we probably put it in there. And we probably told him why you broke up or something if we knew, and it was it was really good. And after school, there was a store downtown called Woolworth, and it had a long counter, and we would all not eat lunch or something, so we'd go to Woolworth after school and have a a malt or a cherry coke or something. And you'd be walking down there, I'd be walking down there, and there'd be some old girl talking to some old guy that she wasn't going with, and they would stop you and say, "Hey, don't you put it in the paper that I was here having." A coke with Joe. I said, "Okay." Of course, I put it in the paper, but uh, and and it was really fun. Well, they finally banned it. My my uh, science prof uh, teacher, when I go to class on Fridays, he would come over to me and says, uh, "You have a copy of that thing? I like to look at it." I was giving him one, Mr. Wilson. Well, I think I don't know if he did it, but it finally got banned. They said we couldn't we couldn't be distributing that paper. It was just some mimeograph paper. We didn't know how to type, so we got Mr. Guerrero, who was our director. Everybody knew Roy Guerrero. He typed it for us. And you met your wife in high school, or when? Yeah, you... I did. I met her. I met her through my sister. My sister and her were the same age, and we had a little get together one time at the house, and uh, we used to have these teenagers dancing when you played records, you know. And uh, I met her there. She was fourteen. I was sixteen. And that was it. We've been married sixty something years. What was that like? What was your courtship like? What was what? what? Your courtship, like how? Well, you no, none. I mean, I, well, it was. I mean, you meet at, you meet before in the morning. You meet after school. And you meet at the ball field. That was it. And uh, my wife's always complained that uh, that when we were, there was a bunch of us. We all hung around together. I went to football game. Go to the Austin High football game. That. Uh, she always tells this story that that we used to take them to the football games, and then we go drop them off, and then we all get together and go eat a hamburger at somewhere there on Seventh City Stadium. But we wouldn't take them. I said we couldn't take them. We had any money. <laughs> so anyway, that that's the way courtships were in those days. Um, that's just the way it was, and uh, it worked out. And when did you get married to her? I got married. Uh, we got married in. Uh, 
1953. I was, I'd been out of high school a couple of years. She had just gotten out of high school. She was 18, I was 20. And then I got, then I went in the army almost immediately after we got married. So you were drafted? No, well, I was, it depends how you look at it. I was in the National Guard. And uh, when they were getting ready to, they, it's a long story, but um, supposedly if you were in National Guard, you, they wouldn't draft you. But, but, the Congress passed some laws that said that if you joined the National Guard after July 1st, 1951 or something, you were eligible for the draft. And I was, I joined on July the 7th or something like that. So uh, what I did, when, I, when they gave, sent me my notice to, to go take the physical to get drafted, I volunteered through the National Guard. So, and what that did for me is that it, it, it gave me some rank to go in instead of going in as a private, I went in as a corporal, which was, uh, I went in one day before I was supposed to report to active duty. But I, I, I was there, but I, I, so I did an in run on him, I guess. And uh, it worked out good for me because I, I didn't have to go through those, some of that stuff those poor new guys have to go through. That basic training is, I went through basic training, but I went to an eight week course instead of 16, which is a lot of difference. What was it like being apart from your wife for the first couple of years of your marriage? What was it like? Mm -hmm. Well, it was a lot of fun. I didn't have to go take her home or anything. <laughs> I just, it was, it was, you know, it was very, I mean, you know, we, you didn't do much in those days. You know, you did good to go to a movie once in a while, go out to eat maybe. Once I got to work, you, you, we go out to eat maybe once a week. Uh, we went to the same place every Friday, San Jacinto Inn, on, on San Jacinto Inn. It's, the university bought all that property up now, but uh, that's where we went. We both ate shrimp. We were Catholic at Friday, we ate shrimp. Both of us ate shrimp for, both of us now, for $6.66, I'll never forget it. <laughs> that's all it cost. But you know what? That was a lot of money. <laughs> that was a lot of my paycheck going into that lunch. Into that lunch. What can you tell us um, about as a Mexican American, was it different? Was your experience in the Korean War different from other people in your unit? Well, it wasn't in in the army. Uh, we, it, that was hardly any difference. I mean, and they treated. Us, I mean, everybody got treated pretty much the same. The problem was the only. It was not a problem. Is that some people that were you were in? I was in the service when I went overseas to Korea. I was in, uh, I was in a group of people. For some reason, there was a lot of them uh, were from. Pennsylvania, and uh, there were 10 or 12 of them from Pennsylvania, one I'm from California. I was the only Texan on there in that little group that went overseas at that time. And, and they had a hard time understanding what I meant when they asked me, because they look at you, and most of those, most of those guys from Pennsylvania were Italians, most of them. And they didn't understand when they say, well, what are you? Uh, I'm Mexican. And to them, it was, it, they never heard that, so they said, you're from Mexico? I said, no, I'm, I'm from Texas. Well, how can we say you're Mexican? Well, you know, to, and, and I, no, I explained to them, but they, they, they didn't get it at first. And, uh, and that was all, they were just guy, he ended up being a good friend of mine. He was standing over where we were having this discussion. He was from California. He said, well, where I'm from, we call them spicks. I said, well, <laughs> And I never heard the word speak. In Texas, I had never heard that word for referring to a, Me to a Mexican American. I've heard a lot of other things, but not, not speak. But obviously it's popular over there. And he and I ended up being big buddies. He was, he was, he was just kind of, he didn't mean anything by it. He was just trying to clear the air with those guys from Pennsylvania. Were there other Mexican Americans in your unit? Yeah, or? in Korea there were. There were, there was, a lot, uh, not a lot of them, there was some from, uh, I became real good friends with one from uh, uh, New Mexico. And there was quite a few from California and Korea. They weren't in our outfit, but they, you know, we'd get together. What about Puerto Rico? Because hmm? um, there's a large contention to Puerto Ricans with the Korean War. 
Did you come across a lot of Puerto Ricans or any? Yeah, yeah. Not 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 too many, but there, there was one that was uh, that that was uh, that was in our same company. Um, from uh, he was from Puerto Rico. What's his name? Juan Juan something. Right. Um, his name was Juan, but um, yeah, they really he would. You know, we were glad to see each other. It didn't matter we were Cuban, Puerto Rican, or what, because there was just a lot of us over there. And, uh, and uh, so it was kind of a, and you certainly never saw hardly anyone from Austin. I mean, I think once I ran to one guy. Were there African Americans? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was there a larger number of African Americans, or was In there the a bank? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. It was, it was probably so, probably more. Um, so it didn't seem to matter as much. Did you have more in common with the Latinos or um, with other Latinos? Well, or? yeah, of course. I mean, you know, um, if you saw, if you, if you meet up with one somewhere, um, first of all, it was real hard to meet up with anybody because they, we didn't have, a, we didn't have in Korea in, in that in new time, we didn't have any like like to have now PXs and place you can go. We didn't have any of that, so we stayed we we stayed within our own little companies, and uh, and we were restricted actually to stay in there. So it's the same people over and over. But if you if you could run into a Latino or somewhere, you kind of had something in common. You could even talk Spanish to each other, which was rare over there because you never saw too many of them. But. Uh, I didn't see too many, though, to tell you the truth. So, in your adolescence, when you came back, did anything change for Mexican-Americans when you came back from Korea, or was it the same? From Korea? No, but not, not a whole lot, but when I noticed a big change was uh, after World War II, I noticed, I started to notice a change. And uh, um, and I think, I've always, my, my, re, my recollection of of history at that time was that, that the war, World War II, not the Korean War, World War II was the big, was the awakening of the, the, the Hispanic community. And I, I think it came about because, uh, uh, well, a lot of things, but one of the main things was that all of a sudden we began to realize, not me, because I, I wasn't in World War II, I was, I was 13 or something when the war ended. Um, was that we? I think the folks that were in the service, and 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 even those that were here, don't realize that uh, what's this deal, man? We, we were over there too. We got, we were getting killed. My brother got killed. My uncle, my father got killed, and a lot of things started to happen. And and one of the most significant things, well, I think, was uh, the American GI form. Uh, uh, to me, when that, uh, and you know. Uh, I, uh, and I, to this day I have a problem. Of course, you can go around it. I heard the story about Three Rivers and I never have gotten over it. And, and I remember telling Governor Richard one day when we were driving down there, I said, you know what? One of the biggest, one of the greatest things ever happened to me was when they built this Highway 37 because I don't have to go to Three Rivers anymore. And it was just because of what happened. I mean, if you're, if you, if uh, a lot of people don't, a lot of young people don't know that story, but uh, I know it, and uh, and uh, and and I still don't like going to Three Rivers, and I have some long lost relatives living in Three Rivers, but you know, I meet them on one of those Valero stations <laughs> on 37 when I when I go down to the valley. I used to go to the valley a lot when I was, when I had a job down there, but the Three Rivers was a. Uh, the American GR Forum was, uh, 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 to me, to me, helped. Uh, uh, and they, their battle was, look, we're veterans. We were over there. What do you mean we can't go here? We can't go there. We can't do this. We can't buy. And often you couldn't buy houses in the subdivision unless you bought the last house at the end of the dead end street. They wouldn't sell them to you. And if you, if, uh, and if you ever look at the, in the old, the old neighborhoods, including the ones here in East Austin. In those days, back then, when you bought a house, you get this book. I have the one from my mother's house. 
three books that had the history of that piece of land. And in the covenants, it, and many of them said you cannot sell, you cannot sell homes to niggers and Mexicans. You, this lot cannot be sold to. They finally ruled that unconstitutional or something. And they, now they can't, even though it's there, they can't use it. So anyway, I, I don't think the Korean War changed a lot of things. I don't think the Korean War did it, uh, did a lot. By that time, things were changing already. In 1950, um, right around there, they integrated, you know, they integrated schools. Uh, and uh, so things got a little better. They're a little rough at times. Because some, some, if they integrated the schools in, the, in that they allowed the African Americans to go to school, which is, we, we were already going. What did you do in Korea? I was I worked in in, in supply. I was I was in uh, what I was a sergeant by then, and I, I was in charge of what they call in the army they call ration breakdown. A ration breakdown is the place that every mess sergeant goes every morning to pick up their ration for the day. They issue you the ration based on the number of soldiers you have, so many cans of peas, so many cans. And we, what we did, we went and picked them up at the, at, in, in the distribution point because they only gave us enough for one day at a time because we didn't have anything that could spoil, would spoil, because we didn't have any way to keep things from. In those days in Korea, I'm sure now they got everything in the world, but we didn't have any place to keep things from spoiling. So we had, we could only issue rations one day at a time. And so we, every night at midnight, we'd drive down to Seoul, pick up the stuff, bring it back. In the morning, the mess sergeant would come by with their little jeeps and their little trailers, and we'd give them whatever they had to have for the next day. Best job in Korea. Everybody loves you because you you have the rations. Um, as a Mexican American growing up in Texas, were there certain occupations or roles in the community that you were expected to fill? Yeah, and there was a lot of them you expected. Not to fill, you know. I, I, you know, like they would never hire. I remember they would not hire. You know, Hispanic. And banks, banks never hired. And you know, being a bank teller isn't the highest paying job in, in Austin. But they wouldn't hire you anyway. And uh, uh, and. Uh, Wait one second. It's a motorcycle or something out there. Yeah, I right hear something. What jobs um, were you not allowed? Like, where did they not hire Mexican? Well, uh, most retail, except except the only retail you could get a job. I remember my wife getting a job at one of those places where at least department stores would hire you, like the Woolworths and stuff. They can hire a lot of them, but they would hire you. But don't try to get a job at a at a nice, uh, ready to wear ladies store or, or something like that. They wouldn't hire you. They wouldn't hire you at the banks. They they wouldn't. There was just a lot of jobs that you know you just they just wouldn't hire you. Uh, and I think I think the women had even a harder time than than the, than the guys than the men. But we we didn't we knew we couldn't do a lot of things. You know a lot of, at that time a lot of us. At at one time a lot of us were printers, man. They would hire you there. We we're pretty good printers, I guess, because and even now. But at that time, you know. Anybody have halfway decent job was a printer, and then if you could get into one of the union shops at that time, there wasn't but a couple of them, and I finally got into one. Then you were really making pretty pretty good money. And uh, but they wouldn't hire you to sell printing; they would hire you to print. <laughs> so you were very limited in your job market opportunities. Oh, they were very limited. And, you know, a lot of I know a lot of guys. Uh, that graduated when I did, and uh, they moved to Chicago, or they moved somewhere where they had relatives, where they thought they could get a better job. And some of those guys, they they go a year after you get out of high school trying to find a job. I mean, it was bad. I mean, they hired as a busboy. Did you know a lot of Mexican Americans that went to college or any? Well, no. At our and at my age, when I graduated in '50, very few of our, of us went to college. And uh, it's improved, of course, a lot. 
Not enough, but a lot. Um, so they, it just didn't happen. And um, we're gonna, so when you worked at the printer, what was the name of the printer? I worked the print shop. Mm -hmm. the print shop. I worked uh, at a, the one I worked before I went in the service was one that was uh, called the Joe Cockrell Company. It was a, it was owned by a couple of brothers, and um, actually, they, initially they hired, I got hired there as a, as a delivery boy, which was just about. Now a lot of those were delivery boys. I mean, we almost had an organization of delivery boys. You know, there was Miller Blueprint hired five or six of us. Steck Company with another print shop hired them, and we just we get together. And, and those pretty good jobs, considered pre at that time. They weren't good jobs. I mean, they didn't pay too much, but uh, that's all you could get. And if you were lucky enough, and I got lucky enough with this guy, if he had a small shop. He knew I wanted to be a printer because I had done a lot of printing in high school and had taken a lot of courses. But uh, he he gave me a, a chance, and uh, and I was the first Mexican he allowed to be a printer, and uh, and uh, and he, he was he was kind of fair, not real fair, because he, he paid me less than he paid the other guy. Till one day when I got to be more a rebel rouser, I decided I'd go see him after work, and he says, I said I don't understand why David gets paid more than I do, and we're we're running the same piece of, not the same equipment, but one just like it. And he said, and he, I think he believes this. He said, well, you know, uh, he, uh, he has a little higher standard of living than you do. I said, I don't think so. I said, I want the same things he does. And I'll tell you one thing, David goes to the same HEB I go to, so what, and they don't sell anything cheaper to me. So he said, okay, I'll think about it. So then about a week later, he called me in and he says, you know, I've been thinking about what you said, and I'm gonna go ahead and raise your salary to David's. And he ended up being a big, a big, a good boss. Uh, when I went in the army, he sent me my Christmas bonus anyway. It's merely to me. When I came back, he said, "You want to come back to work?" I said, "Sure." I said, "Okay." He said, "You'll now be making so much because that's what you would have made if you had stayed here." Man, I turned that guy around, man. And he started hiring Hispanics left and right after that, but it it was a hard it was a hard pull. They really believe you had a different standard of living or something, or you didn't need a big car. You need you could buy with a little cars. I don't know what they thought, but they had some mentality there that was not very good. What did you do as a printer? What was what did a printer do? Well, I, I ran a, you know it's printing press like this stuff that you see laying around here. It, now now they do it different. They do a lot of different way of printing, but in those days see. Any business had letterheads or calling cards or anything had to print them. You know, we did it uh, the old-fashioned way. Now they do digital printing. Everything's done different now. But uh, we just printed products, receipt books, just like that, letterheads, envelopes. You know, put the return address on them. Um, and, and and I always wanted to do that. What does that entail? What does the printing entail? Mm -hmm. What does the printing entail? Like, can you? Oh, why do you do it? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it depends what kind. I did. I did the, what they call offset printing, and what they do is that if you wanted to get something printed like that piece of paper you got in your hand, and you wanted to get thousand copies of that for some reason, in those days the way they did it, they take a picture of that and make a negative. They take the negative and and uh, and lay it out, and they would. Print it on. They would with high violent light. They would uh, put it in a machine and they would burn that image onto an aluminum plate. And then you take that plate after it's made and you, you fix it. You get it, the image to come out. And then you put it on a on a printing press and you ink it up. And when you ink it up, the ink only sticks to the part you want printed. And it goes in one end and comes out the other and it's printed. And you do a thousand copies and. And you wrap it up, and we charge you for it. That's offset printing, listo print, the fancy name for it. But uh, it, um, that's what I did. And that was more of a modern way of printing because the old-fashioned printing, where they actually used type, they actually put it together letter by letter. I did that in high school. But that's the way they teach you when you first learning how to print. 
But uh, and now it's it's a very advanced technology now. I mean, you know, it's they almost. I had a guy tell me the other day. He said, you know, he's still doing it, and uh, he said, man, you would recognize it now more. He said, no, you don't hardly do anything. He said, to do just everything with the computer and you print. And why did you want to be a printer? Well, because uh, I think the main reason was that I thought that that uh, you could make more money doing that. Than other things that some of my friends were doing, like delivering and, and uh, working in construction jobs and driving a dump truck. And uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those jobs, but I, I, I just thought it'd be better if I could do something else. Um, so going back to when you were in school, what did teachers expect from Mexican-American students? I don't. I think it's. I think about it now. I don't think they expected it very much. I mean, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't really care if you passed or failed. I remember. Um, I tell this story. My wife tell this story about the, it happened to her. That she, she wrote. My, my wife's a pretty good writer. I mean, she doesn't do it professionally, but she can write pretty good. And she wrote this deal in English class, and the teacher gave her an F for it. Told her you didn't write this. She said, Yes, I did. No, you didn't. You copied it from somewhere. Just gave her an F. Just, just, there's no way she, she could have possibly done that. And uh, you know, she got too very emotional. She got real upset about that. And you know, but uh, they couldn't do anything about it. Uh, they, they didn't. I don't think they paid any special attention to us. I mean, I think in some cases they might have thought we were just a drag on the classroom. But uh, uh, you had to do it on your own. I mean, they didn't. You didn't get any special, any special help that I could tell. Uh, at that time. Back then, students would get, especially the younger students, they would get in trouble for speaking Spanish in Oh, class. absolutely. Did that ever happen to you? Oh, yeah. But not, not in high school so much, because by that time, we, we knew the roots a little bit better and we avoided it. But in elementary school, although we were all Mexicans at Zavala, uh, they would, uh, they would, if they caught you, you know, the, 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 the punishment that was most, they'd use the most is to hit you with a ruler on your hand. Like and uh, and if, if 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 you check my that any of the stories that I've given is the one that I give about uh, when I was in Zavala um, uh, in nineteen oh my god nineteen seventy one I had just gotten elected county commissioner and the U.S. Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the Austin Independent School District and um, and. Uh, and the lead-off witness for the Department of Justice was one Richard Moya. Uh, and I told that story about Savala. And uh, the lawyer for the school district was a very famous lawyer, Lyndon Johnson's lawyer. And I knew him because I had worked for legal aid. By this time, I had changed from being a printer to working for legal aid. And I knew him because he helped us get funded. And uh, so he, he was kind of a friend of mine. So he's over there defending ISD, I think, for nothing. And he's getting over there trying to get off the subject and all that. And he finally got to the point, he says, well, did they ever uh, hit you with a ruler for speaking Spanish? I said, no, sir. And he says, why not? I said, well, they never caught me. And, you know, everybody started laughing in the courtroom. And the judge even kind of laughed a little bit. And uh, But Donald didn't want to talk about what was going on in the school. He wanted to talk about how I got hired and how I did this and how I did that. And, how great legal aid was, and of course legal aid was great for poor people, especially then, uh, because there was a lot to do then, because they hadn't had any help ever. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it was it was rough. The kids, uh, the teachers, uh, to me, and you know, and I'm and I don't have any proof of this, but I think if you were a bad teacher, they'd send you to That's what I think, because they weren't very good teachers. I didn't know it then, but I mean, I've come to realize it that, you know, our teacher, my first grade teacher, I find, we find out much later, uh, and she's a well-known name here, my first grade teacher uh, didn't have a teaching certificate, we find out later. Uh, so in first grade, we didn't do anything. You know what we did? We raced a rabbit. We had a rabbit, and we'd go out there. Nexus of all school is where Pan Am is now. That was a big old field. 
Um, it's mostly clover leaf stuff that we got there first grade, and we had this rabbit in this cage, and we'd go form a circle all of the kids, so the rabbit couldn't get out. Then we let the rabbit out, let him eat for a while, and put him back in the cage, take him back in. And uh, and and. Uh, Second grade teacher, Ms. Eubank, she was just meaner than heck, man. I mean, you, she was looking for you to speak Spanish so she could call you up. She'd do it in front of the room. You know, she'd call you up there. Weren't any of your teachers Mexican-American? Hmm? As of all of, were your teachers, were any of them Mexican-American? Well, I was, I'm getting ready to give a name away. My first grade teacher was. And was that your only Mexican-American? Yeah. Teacher? Yeah. Um, what were some other obstacles that you faced into your later years, still as a young adult, but after high school or even during high school? Well, you know, they were the, I, I, we didn't, uh, you know, a lot of us just didn't realize, uh, I did, I started to realize, but I didn't realize, you know, that what was happening to us, you know, they kind of just rolled with a punch, I guess you might say. Um, activities. We, we didn't get to participate in the activities. Uh, we, uh, we uh, for instance, we couldn't join any of those clubs that they have in high schools. We couldn't join any of them. I'll tell a story about a, a friend of mine, and he's still a friend of mine, and, uh, he, 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 and he's, his name was Franklin McMullen. Uh, that American Legion Hall there on that Clauston Boulevard, that was his, his great-grandfather was a general or something. He donated that house. And he lived in a very ritzy part of town. If you lived in infield tear town, we knew you were rich, you know. So the story, and he, he and I, because our last name started with an M, I guess, we became real good friends. And I remember one day, uh, he, he came up to me and he says, uh, uh, Richard, are you, uh, are you Spanish? I said, no, I'm not Spanish, I'm Mexican. And he said, oh, I can't invite you to my party. Well, I probably wouldn't have gone to his party anyway. But anyway, uh, and it was because I was Mexican. I mean, his, I guess his folks must have told him, don't invite any Mexicans, you know. So he he wanted, he was hoping I would say I was Spanish, I guess. <laughs> I wouldn't have worked with his parents when I got there anyway. But he, And then those kind of things happened. And we, we kind of accepted, uh, and we shouldn't have, but we, I think we kind of accepted that you um, get to stick together and be amongst ourselves. And uh, I remember when we went to one of our reunions, all of a sudden, all us Mexicans, this was like a 50th year reunion or something, all our Mexicans were sitting over there by ourselves, with, together. I remember going over there and saying, hey, you guys, we don't have to do this anymore. We can sit anywhere we want to. And, but no, but tradition, tradition, would follow us. And in fact, at that 50 year reunion, I remember telling the group there, I said, you know what I noticed? I don't know y'all have. These kids that we went to school with treat us better now than they did when we were in school with them. Well, they've learned. And, and I'm sure their kids don't have the same prejudice that they had. And, and as it goes down the line, the, the prejudice kind of start to go, go away. As a child, you didn't see this prejudice. Well, no, because I was a Zavala, and I mean, it was, we were all, I mean, we, we weren't smart enough to realize why we all, we were glad we were all going to Zavala, to tell you the truth. I mean, when you think about it, uh, I, we're, we are that way. I remember when we had to, when the busing started after I'd lost it, I just talked to, talk, told you about it. A lot of, a lot of our, by this time, I was an adult, and 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 I was in public office, and a lot of the folks were upset. A lot of the Hispanic families in Austin during that lawsuit that required the busing never understood why that was, and they actually objected to it. See, so yeah, good, there you go, and uh, they they didn't understand. Uh, uh, and that, that sounds kind of weird, though. But I mean, not everybody, but a lot of them, they, they didn't want to do it. And oh, of course, the Anglos, I know they didn't want to do it <laughs> because they were bringing kids from. At that time, you know, back there, it doesn't mean much to you, but uh, uh, Bob Hans was a county commissioner, and his kids had to come to Savala. I thought it was pretty great. 
He didn't. <laughs> but that's the way it was. You and your wife finished high school, but how many Mexican Americans dropped out of school? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I've, I've looked at that, and most of our kids, and I'm, I'm by our kids, I was a kid then too, dropped out earlier than that. I think the big, and I think it's still true. I don't know. I don't study that too much. My daughter does a little bit, but um, most people drop out. Hispanics drop out in junior high or middle school, about the eighth or ninth grade. I think that people that study this stuff will tell you that there's more drop out at that point than there is later on because they can't drop out later on. They already dropped out. But uh, I think it has something to do though. At, at when you're an eighth or ninth grader. You begin to realize that uh, you know that you're not able to keep up with the other and how you dress and where you go and what you do. But hopefully we could cut back on the dropout. But it's it, it's high and, and it, I don't care if one drops out; it'd be too high for me. But uh, uh, and, but a lot of them never got to high school. Never got there. And uh, they either get in trouble or drop out, or some of them get you know, lie about their age and join the army, or you know they did all kinds of things, uh, get pregnant and get a baby. And then those days, if you got pregnant and when you were in high school, they kick you out of school. You couldn't stay in school. In fact, uh, I was I was one of the charter members of the Teenage Parent Council, which started uh, not kicking them out of school. If you got married, and even if you weren't pregnant, they kick you out of school, or they try. So if you got married, for some reason I don't know why you want to get married that young. But if you did, uh, you better not let them find out about it. So, how many Mexican Americans pro professionals did you encounter? Since there's so many kids dropping out, did you encounter a lot of Mexican American professionals growing up? Having not growing up, but after you know. Uh, I think uh, I've realized there's a lot of professionals, uh, but you, we, we weren't exposed to them. Uh, uh, I started working for legal aid, and then when I started hanging, you know, when I started hanging around the courthouse, I found out there were some. But you know, when I when I first uh, worked at legal aid in '65, there wasn't there wasn't eight Hispanic lawyers in Austin. I don't know, it was five. But I, I can't. I don't, Gabe was one of them from here. But um, now there's lots of them, uh, and that's good. And there's a lot of professionals in in every field because they're beginning to harm. You know, for some professionals, being a Hispanic is an advantage now. And uh, you know, I've noticed a big, uh, you know, a big growth in, uh, and it, there's a lot of good money in that as being a being an engineer. I, I do some consulting work for an engineering company. Man, they're out there looking for engineers, that can, <coughs> Hispanic engineers they can hire. They just want to hire them because, you know, you know, you got some of these cities like, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. Time out. Time out. You want my water? <laughs> uh, that, um, because they're requiring them to, to hire them to get to work. You know, like in San Antonio, man, you better have 28% Hispanic subs or they're not going to give you the job. That, that's <coughs> so if you have a, an engineering firm and you're going to try to do government work, you better get you some. And in fact, you would be real smart to make one of them a partner. <laughs> you'd be really smart. And instead of just yeah, I got them. I hire them. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so anyway, that to answer your question, uh, it, it changed a lot. When I grew up in a time where there was very few. Okay. And when I get, like I say, in high school, you know, the, uh, sad to say, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the, the young ladies graduated around in forty, in fifty, forty-nine, forty-eight. I, I, I'm afraid their ambition was to go get married. Well. That's hell of a reason to graduate from high school. I mean, you ought to get married if you want to, but that shouldn't be your goal to get out of high school so you can get away from home or whatever the reason was. I don't know what the reason was. But um, there was no no ambition. I mean, you know, 
that you couldn't do any, any you do you knew you couldn't get those jobs. Did your wife have ambition to do anything other than? Well, yeah, but you know, she she couldn't go to she she wanted to go to college, but they couldn't. And she she her mother was single single head of household. They couldn't afford to do that. She just got her job. Um, she did get the job in uh, uh, retail at a pretty good store, but I, I think it was mostly because her mother worked there in the, in the back there. She worked at uh, at that time famous store here for ladies ready to wear good friends, and she worked there till. Uh, and then I when I got ma we got married, then I went in the army, and and she continued to work there. Uh, and then uh, then I, when I came back. Uh, and uh, she, she started having babies, she didn't work anymore. Who inspired you when it came to creating advancements for Mexican Americans? I'll tell you what, the guy that inspired me the most, and, and I tell everybody this, so I'm glad you asked, was the guy that ran the Pan American Recreation Center named Roy Guerrero. Roy Guerrero did more for Hispanics, kids, than anybody I know. Um, and that's why I was happy and thrilled to death to, to lead the charge to name that park over there. And you know, to me, uh, he kept a lot of kids out of trouble. I mean, and in, in, in the way he did it was with athletics. He did it with athletics. You know, he'd get us involved in playing ball, and you know, I told you about my softball team, he, he helped me organize that team. And, and we, we stayed together for 25 years, some of us playing, until we got too old to pick up the ball, you know, almost, you know. And uh, so Mr. G, as we call him, um, was way ahead of his time. There's no doubt in my mind that if he was here today, he'd be head of the Park and Recreation Department, because he could do it. But they, you know, same thing, you know. They let him move up a little bit, they didn't let him move up all the way to the top. And it was to our advantage that they kept him at Pan Am, it was certainly to my advantage. Because uh, since then, you know, they've had a lot of good people be director, but there's nobody like Roy. And uh, so, to me, he was he was my role model, and 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 I tell everybody that. And a lot of people will agree with me that he was their role model, because yeah. he kind of kept you going, and 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 uh, was very good. Spent a lot of time. I, I think neglected his family a lot to to be there with us. He'd come down when he was off if something happened, and. Uh, so uh, I know that anybody who's been in Austin at all knows about Mr. G, and uh, uh, if we called him, affectionately called him. And uh, so for him, yeah, I've always said that it wouldn't have been for him, I, I probably wouldn't have amounted to anything, because he kind of kept me in line. And he was always calling my dad away from home because I was at Pan Am more than I was at home. I mean, I go straight from school to Pan Am till it's closed, then I come home. <laughs> And I live real close to it, and, and uh, um, but he was the main one, and uh, he inspired a lot of us, um, some directly and some indirectly. But uh, uh, yeah, he's the guy. You know, build a monument for him somewhere. Can you explain what Pan Am is for? Pan Am is just, was just a, a recreation center. That um, that was about the only thing we had over here in East Austin back in those days. And at, originally, when Roy first went over there, it, uh, it was at a house, an old schoolhouse, the AISD, on the, in the corner of Third and Comal. In fact, it wasn't called Pan Am then; we call it La Comal. And uh, uh, we'd go there after school, and li very limited budget. You know, he didn't have much money to operate with. He didn't have any help. Uh, we played ball, basketball on a, on, on a dirt court. Didn't have metal backboards where the ball hit the thing, there's no telling where it was going to bounce to. And uh, little by little, though, he organized that community and formed that Pan Am Advisory Board, which I ended up being on, but, um, and put pressure on the city, and they built that Pan Am Center uh, with their next to Savala back in 55. Um, but it was a place where people gathered, and he did a lot of other things other than recreational stuff. He had, for example, he had, he had uh, a, a bunch of ladies called the American Friends Service Committee, which is really Quakers, a bunch of Quakers, and he got them to come down to, to Pan Am and teach uh, citizenship classes to people that wanted to become American citizens, but uh, they had to 
You have to learn to a lot of stuff. I helped my mother do her, her classes. I told my mom after she became a citizen, you know more about who than most people do because you have to know who the senators are, who your congressman is, you know, form of government, all that kind of stuff. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so he had citizenship classes and, and there was a bunch of little old ladies that would come on Tuesday nights and he went and scrunched up a bunch of sewing machines and we had, he had sewing classes for them. And then you know what he did for us boys? We had cooking classes. And he was cook. He was everything. <laughs> he did everything. And uh, we, I, we loved taking those cooking classes. Of course, some of the other boys make fun of us because we had to wear these aprons. <laughs> and they, they, they throw over a bunch of sissies or something. But, but anyway, and he helped me print the blah, blah, and blah. He was a secret editor of the blah, blah, and blah. And um, yeah, he's a big inspiration to me. Everybody knows me, knows that, because I tell everybody. <coughs> Why cooking classes? I don't know. Keep us from getting in trouble, gal. If we wouldn't be doing cooking class, we'd be out there roaming the street doing something we shouldn't be doing. His, his, his concept was to keep us busy, and it worked. It worked. When did you start the softball team? In 1948. And it went on for 25 years? Yeah, we, I, I, the team went on. To, I, I quit managing that team in 1974. I was, I've was i been a commissioner too, but I just couldn't do it anymore. It, it took a lot of time. I just couldn't do it. And <clears throat> so I turned it over to somebody else, and I, it, it all went down the drain eventually. But um, but he, uh, he uh, would take the toughest guy. <coughs> He took a bunch of gang members, and um, they were really a problem for us down there. Now I need that water. So we're going to move on to your professional life and your political sure. experience. Um, what was the first taste that you had or the first position that you held in a political movement? Well, that, uh, uh, I guess... Let's just give it one second. Let's, uh, sorry, oh, sorry. Those big blue eyes, you're so fast. There you go. That's great. <laughs> Can you pick? I don't know if I'm supposed to be looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. Just natural? Okay. Uh, you want to ask that again? Uh, your professional experience, what was your first um, position in anything related to political movement? I think uh, uh, I had been involved a little bit in, in political stuff, but not not real actively. You know, I voted and I, and I care who won and all that stuff. But I had never really gotten involved too much on on the you know the nitty gritty day to day stuff. But um, and the reason the way I got involved um, was not actually well, it was kind of political, but it wasn't for any candidate. I ended up uh, getting. I mean, really involved in the in the economy furniture stuff strike. A lot of my friends' uh, parents uh, worked at economy furniture, and uh, we knew about their problems, or we talk about their problems. And uh, and uh, a long story short, they they voted to unionize, and of course the owners of the furniture store, the furniture factory didn't like that at all, and and uh, started. Uh, wouldn't recognize the union. You can you can organize, but at the end you got to try to get the employer to recognize them and honor, at least talk to them. And <clears throat> they wouldn't do it. And at that time, economy furniture workers, I would say probably 85% of them were Hispanic. Um, uh, they 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 came to realize that they were not being paid enough, and they came to also understand that they would bring people in. 
uh, not Hispanic, and the workers there would train them, and next thing you know, they were supervisors. Now they're making more money. You train them, and then you train me, and I become supervisor, and then I, be, I end up getting paid more than you are. So anyway, that, that kind of led to it. The strike got really nasty. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, the owners, I don't even mention their name, but the owners uh, try to break the strike, try to bust the strike by bringing, you know, workers in. Uh, in the union movement, you call them scabs, but what they are is they're not union. <laughs> they're just not part of the union. They're just crossing the picket line. Um, I, I don't know. I think it was Dan Ruiz uh, with a real good friend of mine, and his daddy was one of the strikers. And uh, so I started kind of helping them. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but if you could just begin that sentence again with the Dan Rice was a friend of yours. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know exactly how I ended up getting directly involved, but I think it was because of Dan Royce. He was a friend of mine, and his daddy was a striker, and uh, uh, and his brother. They were both worked at Economy Furniture, and they had, they had both uh, formed a union and gone on strike, and so they therefore got laid off. So they were, um, I, I started help getting involved because I believed in that movement and, and, and I believed what they, what they were doing was right. And, uh, uh, and you got to remember by then, uh, I had been, I had been a union printer myself. And, and I knew the advantages of being in a union. Uh, one of the biggest advantages that uh, you negotiate for increases together, not individually. You know, give me a raise, but you don't have to give her a raise. But just simply, everybody gets a raise, or nobody gets a raise. So uh, I got involved in it and got really involved with it, started helping them any way I could. I was down there every day after work and, and uh, got people involved in it and got thoroughly involved with it. And what happened was that these strikers uh, appreciated anybody that would help them other than than themselves. I mean, the strikers were all helping each other, but they, they they started a movement, a big movement. A lot of people started getting involved, and um, things started getting kind of bad. I mean, they, there was fights, uh, with, and uh, there was charges and counter charges, and <clears throat> they all got filed in the JP court, and the JP guy, Bob Coon, was a friend of mine, and uh, a real good friend of mine. And I'd helped him in his campaign, not much, but I helped him a little bit. So anyway, long story short, I got involved in that strike. Uh, that was 1969. Uh, <clears throat> the strike was, and, and in 1969, during while, while the strike was going on, um, a, a decision came down from the United States Supreme Court uh, that was been filed by uh, a group of people against the Midland County Commissioner's Court. Uh, and and the, the basis for that suit was that they they didn't draw the line, they drew the lines every 10 years, but they didn't draw them using population numbers. They used, like most commissioners in those days, they used geographic lines, like we'll draw a line down the river to separate north and south, and Congress Avenue separates east and west. And it doesn't matter how many people live there that just did. Well, they, they had done something similar here. But anyway, Midland County decision said, uh, told, the, told the, the commissioners in Midland County, not everybody, but it obviously it affected everybody, that they couldn't do that. They had to draw them by population. The, the, each commissioner's district should have it as close as possible to the same number of people, not voters, people, you know, babies and everybody, citizens, non citizens, whatever. <clears throat> Well, when that decision came down in August of 69, I think it was, uh, we knew very little about it, but it, it turned out that our district attorney here in Travis County went and told the commissioner's court here in Travis County, y'all got to abide by that deal. It, it, it's far reaching. It includes every county in Texas. So y'all got to redraw your lines. Your lines are all out of whack. Uh, you know, one district had like 12 and a half percent of the population, another one had like 50, and you know, it's all screwed up. So um, somehow or the other, during a strike, we all kind of started noticing, started reading about that, and we saw the numbers come out that the commissioner in Precinct 4 had 12.5% of the population, and he couldn't go 
He couldn't go east because it's the county line. He couldn't go south because the county line. And uh, so the only way he could go would be west or east. And the west district was almost right, but coincidence. So the only way he could grow, had to grow according to that Supreme Court decision, he had to go east. And guess where he had to go? To the Hispanic boxes. So Gabe, whose office we're sitting in here, was one of, was one of the lawyer was a lawyer, and he, he was helping him with the numbers. And, and he said, you know what? That guy is going to have to pick up all the Hispanic boxes. Maybe we can beat him. He said, beat him. I'll beat him. And so we start starting the numbers, and all of a sudden it got out during a strike that did, it was possible. <laughs> all of a sudden, about seven or eight people wanted to run for county commission in Precinct 4 because all the Hispanic boxes were going to be in it. And so, including me. And so the strike, the, so the filing deadline comes around, and, um, and all of the aid, they start dropping out. Gabe gets out, he's out, I'm going to help more. Yeah. Raymond advice over him on top of said, I'll help Moya. So they, you know, all of them got out except Jesse Torres, Paul Tovar, and me. And we just couldn't reach an agreement. Finally, Jesse got out. Paul and I couldn't, couldn't decide who to get out. I didn't want to get out. He didn't want to get out. I'm, you know, I said, well, you know, we'll probably both lose now because the incumbent will beat us. But, um, you know, I can get out. And my, my people who are supporting me was incidentally were mostly strikers. I mean, they was they were they were my they were it, man, for me. And uh, so, uh, long story short, I run for commissioner. Both of runs. Terrible campaign. It was it, it was. We hadn't been. <laughs> we weren't used to having his party run for anything because we didn't know how to handle it. And it was a lot of confrontations. Uh, it was really sad. In fact, one one of my guys. One of the guys supporting me got killed uh, by one of Toad. Not Toad had didn't have anything to do with it. We just a Toad supporter, and uh, he didn't have a damn thing to do with it. And I knew it. But uh, anyway, that was the worst part of it. But we went on and on. And then, uh, if it hadn't been for the strikers, I wouldn't have won. I couldn't have won. I mean, they did everything. They were on the picket line one hour a day. They spent the other eight or nine hours over my headquarters. Uh, making signs, knocking on doors, doing whatever needed to be done, raising money. Uh, so uh, I had the workforce, and, and, and Paul didn't. So uh, um, so we, we uh, ran the campaign. It was about a week before, about four days before the first run, the first election of that campaign with three candidates. And um, like my first campaign, I'll never forget it, we'd never had enough money for nothing. We had a little money to buy Miller Lite for the workers, but we never had any money to do the real stuff. So uh, um, Gonzalo was our Miller Lite representative <laughs> at that time. And I had all the, I had guys like John Trevino, who ended up being on the city council, um, was my campaign manager. He quit his job at Miller Blueprint delivering, uh, like, and uh, uh, quit his job at Miller Blueprint, had about six kids, and quit his job to run that campaign. And um, and uh, so you know there was a lot of real commitment. Not to, and I always say it wasn't to me. It was to the economy people, and it was to the area. It, I was just a vehicle, you know. I just happened to be the candidate. And uh, so about a week before the the election, we decided, man, if we don't get some Spanish radio, we're gonna lose this thing, man. The Paul didn't have any Spanish radio. We said we got to get some Spanish radio. Well, how much money to take? Well, somebody figured out we need to, we need to twelve hundred dollars. So, uh, so I don't think we're going to get twelve hundred dollars. I mean, we spent it. We'd already spent, you know, several thousand dollars that we had raised. We raised it. We had these pachangas at Saragossa Park, and you know, we did all kinds of Hispanic stuff, dances. We did everything you could think of. Jamaica, I mean, raffle tickets. You knew, you knew it was. It was. It was a real grassroots campaign. I'll never forget it. And, we, and it was great. Um, so, um, Gonzalo. Um, he goes, he goes down to, he's working for OEO then, um, property problems. He goes over there and rounds up about eight guys, Ernie Nieto, Gonzalo, some Bolivian, some Anglos, and he convinced them <laughs> to, 
to go down to the credit union and borrow a thousand dollars, and they would pay it back every month. So money, they would all pitch in so much a month to pay the loan back. You know they did that. So they here, here comes a thousand dollars. Gonzalo brings a thousand dollars. Frank Moffitt, some other guys that I knew, Jim brought, Joe brought. Um, they were all helping me, you know. Uh, so then we do the radio. But then, then John says, uh, it's, it's not doing enough. It's not penetrating enough. $1,000 doesn't buy enough stuff. We need to get another five, $600. Now it's about three days before the election. And, and uh, so he tells everybody, we, we need $600 in addition to the 1000 We already spent 1000 on the radio. And uh, so the, the strikers are there listening to all this pitch by John Trevino trying to get figure something started committing a crime, I mean, to get $600. Uh, so the strikers, one of the strikers gets up and he says, we'll do it. I said, John said, how y'all gonna do it? Y'all can't do it. Y'all know, your families are starving and you know, you know, you don't have jobs. He said, here's what we're gonna do. And he, he, the, the, he had talked to a union guy, he says, tomorrow when we get paid, we're gonna give him more of the check, $21. Each. And I went and bought the radio. Long story short, I, I got in the runoff with the, the incumbent. The incumbent had been there 21 years. Been there 21 years, but he hadn't faced all these boxes over here. And then at that time, when we talked earlier about gentrification, this was all Hispanics. I mean, you know, there was a few, not many, Anglos, not many. So anyway, so we go by the radio, we're getting the runoff. Um, and so now, now we've got to raise money again. We've got 30 days. And uh, everybody, all the posters, the predictors of everything, you know, said, you can't win. You know, you can't win it. And we said, well, the hell we can. We can win it. We just got to, so we got to do something anyway. <clears throat> we don't have the money anymore. We can't, we already drained everybody out of everything. Wasn't about to go as the old, the old guys go back to the finance company. My daddy had already put the money in it. He didn't have any more to put in. And so we decided that we we're just going to knock on every door, just in our part of town. Not in their part of town, just in our part of town. So we got organized and we started knocking on doors. And election day, uh, on election day, we told everybody, take a day off from work, if you're working, come to the headquarters and come dress the way you go to work. So if you're a nurse, you come dress in your nurse outfit. If you change tires at Western Auto, wear that outfit. If you work for the city, dress. That's an unbelievable story. We had 350 people show up that morning. 350 people. By one o'clock that afternoon, we had knocked on everybody's door three times. Everybody's door. Whether they could vote or not, it didn't matter. We weren't looking at voter lists because we had too many volunteers. We didn't have to. So, long story short, I won. And uh, two boxes were not in, Pan Am and Gold Valley. So, uh, we knew they were for us, but we didn't know we were behind 650 votes. And the media was already interviewing the guy. He had won the courthouse. Everybody, it's over, just two little boxes left. Well, I knew a little better than that. I thought, well, we might be able to catch him. Well, we did. We caught him, we passed him. We beat him by 600 and something votes. Uh, Pan, Am, Pan Am voted like 350 to two. And Go Valley voted 672 to, to 52 or something. Of course, now the Anglers want to file a lawsuit because we had rigged the election, obviously, right? <laughs> they wanted to recount and all kinds of stuff. But that's the way we did it. Pure grassroots, door to door. And, uh, uh, and then I remember Johnny telling me after we won, he says, um, what do we do now, Moy? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what we do. <laughs> so that's the story. And, and from then on, it was a lot easier, and I won for more times. And, um, but um, that's the way we did it politically. And it was fun to be a commissioner at that time because there was a lot to do. It, it, it's just like working for legal aid. I mean, we had more cases we didn't know what to do with. It's poor people, especially women. And legal aid, a lot of them needed to get divorced, guys, but they couldn't, they didn't have any money. And the guy had the money. 
So they, you know, they couldn't get divorced. We were divorcing women and left and right, man. And they needed to be divorced. I mean, they really did. I mean, they weren't divorced people just to get divorced. There were people that, you know, they were just bad guys. And they would take care of the families. And the next, the next possible, the next thing after we got them all divorced, get them to pay child support. These guys would go get a job where they get paid by the out by cash, so they wouldn't have to pay the child support. You'd be amazed what people would do. But anyway, um, legal aid taught me a lot, and uh, then and being a commissioner was really easy because there was a lot to do. My boy, the guy I beat, had 21 employees, and they were all Anglo. No women. It was easy to go uphill on that deal, man. <laughs> Every time I had a vacancy, I'd fill it. I didn't fire anybody. I told him, I'm not. He got a rumor out that I was going to fire all the Anglos, our Mexicans. And I said, I, I met with a group. I said, look, I ain't firing nobody as long as you do your job. But I will tell you one thing if one of you retires, I'm going to hire one. Just, you know, just so they'd be ready. And, and I did, little by little by little. We, we got it mixed up. I mean, I didn't hire all of one kind, you know, but uh, nobody should do that. The good ones stayed. Some of them stayed there for the whole 16 years I was there. Um, and some of them left. Some of them left on their own. Some of them retired or got a job somewhere else and left. But um, so then, uh, then in the, in the political deal that we decided after we got elected that this was only the beginning. We couldn't just settle for one. We need to elect other people. So then we started working on other campaigns. We elected a Hispanic JP, a Hispanic constable, a Hispanic, a Hispanic legislator. Hispanic district clerk, a Hispanic treasurer, some judges, and cool board man. It goes on and on, and now it's not pretty much accepted. In 1969, you were still at Legal Aid, correct? Right. So you told the statesman in 1969 that you felt like you had to run for commissioner. Why did you feel like you had to run? Well, I felt I had to run because I felt that the opportunity to elect a Hispanic to the commissioner's court were a Hispanic had never been on a commissioner's court, or an African American, or a woman, for that matter. None of those things had ever happened. And, <clears throat> and I felt that this was the opportunity that was handed to us by the federal courts, by the Supreme Court, that they had to draw the lines. And I felt that if we didn't, if we didn't run anybody in, in, in 70, and we didn't elect somebody, the chances of keeping those lines and making sure they got drawn properly, you almost had to have somebody there to, to work on it. Uh, we were lucky that we had a few one county commissioners that believe in what we were trying to do. Not we, but what, that, that the Hispanics could have a chance to elect somebody. Not guarantee us a one. We just wanted an opportunity to elect one. That's all we're asking for in this 10 one city stuff. We want an opportunity to elect. We're not, they're not, they're not guaranteeing us anything. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't. They should just give us the opportunity to do it. And then it's up to us to take advantage of the opportunity. So I felt like we had to run because um, I thought it was time to have someone. I knew at the I knew about the county because I as as I worked for legal aid. I I worked in we had an office in the courthouse, so I knew what well, what the makeup was there. When I got elected county commissioner, there was eight Hispanics working for county government. Period. In all the county offices in the county, there was eight Hispanics, and half of them were in one department. So nobody was hiring them. Nobody was. They just, I tell you, you have a representative over there that has to look over those people's budget every year. You might get them to do it. And they did. They started doing it. And you can go now if you want to. I mean, it, it's, it's well mixed. And it's good. It, and it's the way it should be. Uh, in the old days there, the way it worked uh, at the county, at least the way I saw it, was that if you, if you worked there, in, uh, in the county clerk's office and you were in Anglo, you would stay there till your daughter was old enough to take your place. And she would also be in Anglo, right? So unless we promote a lot of mixed marriages, we weren't gonna get this job done very quickly. So, uh, and, and they would tell me, they, the, the, some of the elected officials tell me at budget times, oh, I have two slots. I said, what do you mean by two slots? Well, I have two Hispanics and if one of them quits, I'll hire another Hispanic. I said, well, how did we get to three? They couldn't answer that. They couldn't answer that. Because I was, you know, to a lot of people over there, I was kind of a bully because I gave them all a hard time about things like that. But, you know, I felt that was my job. And uh, um, 
If I didn't fight for him, who was? I was the only one who was sitting up there that could had control over the budget. And man, they fought it, man. The other thing they fought was, uh, if I tell you that in 1972, 73, 74, the Travis County Commission, the Travis County government did not have a human resources office, would you believe that? No, of course not. But you know how why they didn't have one? Because that way each individual department head did their own hiring. They still do it. But what we do now, we help them get applicants. So, so you and I, had the, the gal I hired could type 120 words a minute. That's pretty good. She went and applied at seven departments because each department gave her a typing test. None of them hired her. They hired people with less skill but a different color. Uh, so I couldn't get them, I couldn't get them, I get the commissioner to create the office of human resource manager, in those days personnel director, that's the name. Um, and the only, I finally got three votes under one condition. And the condition was that the personnel director would be hired and work for the county auditor. Well, that's not the good deal, but to me, I took it because at least I opened the door a little bit. I figured in a few years, that auditor wasn't going to want to be <laughs> hire the personnel director because that's not exactly audited, you know. But they didn't, they, didn't want, they didn't want it to be under the commissioner because I'd be there, you know, and I was going to tell them entirely Mexicans, you know, blacks, women. Um, so, yeah, and sure enough, a couple of years, you know, yeah, I don't want to do it anymore. So we took the guy he hired and made him a human resource manager. He wasn't very good. We Eventually he left and we hired somebody good. Because now instead of you having to go to seven departments to type 120 words a minute, you went to one. And we had you on record and if a vacancy became available in the county clerk, district clerk, they needed somebody to type 120, we have a name for you. We're not telling you her, but here she is. She's qualified. And it started to change and it's changed a lot now. Now everybody uses them. Some of the department heads wouldn't use the personal office. We couldn't make them because they were elected. The ones that work for us, we could make them do it. But uh, you're elected county clerk. You can. You just need to talk to us about your budget. That's all. After all of that, you can tell us to go to hell. But uh, they didn't do it because the budget's kind of important, you know. But um, so that's the way it went, and it was a lot of changes that had to be made at the, at the county level, and. Uh, so I enjoyed being part of that. It's all done now. They, 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 I don't think they do as good a job of watching it as they should. Um, I think we're, the county's failing miserably, and, and uh, they don't. They, they could do better. I think it's uh, it's making sure that minority business get some of that action done there. Some of those some of those construction projects. Not, not maybe the head job, but they could sub them. They could require the subs be. Uh, minorities, if they, if they can do it, I'm not even not just because they're minorities. You never want to do that because when you start doing that, you're going to end up with egg in your face if you just hire someone just because they're Hispanic. They have to be qualified. So why county commissioner as opposed to city councilman or Texas Senate? For me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's another story that goes with that, and uh, that I hadn't told. <clears throat> The way all this movement got started with the economy strike and election officials, it all started um, back when, uh, in, in, during that 65, 69 era, there was a, there was a, there was a war on poverty going on. And, and this story is, is what I want I to talk to Maggie about sometime. Is, uh, <coughs> there was a, there were three programs in Austin that were all run out of the same building in East Austin. John Trevino <coughs> would run a city program called um, Community Inf Information and Referral Office. It was a federally funded program. <coughs> what it did was help people go to the right place. You know, poor people don't know where to go. I helped some middle, middle Americans don't know where to go. But poor people in particular don't know where to go. 
So, you know, anybody lived in that area wanted, you know, maybe you needed, uh, didn't know what to do about their social security, John would, would find out who to talk to, would arrange an appointment for him and send him away. Good program. Um, there was another program right out of there called Project Enable. Project Enable was a similar program, but it was set to, to help neighborhood groups uh, know how to go about getting a stop sign put at an intersection, uh, lights, fix a pothole, get rid of a lady that has a business there or shouldn't be there. That program was federally funded, but it was a pilot program. It was only going to last two years. And the guy that was running that program was a, name, a guy named Gonzalo Barrientos. And there was one other program there, it's called Legal Aid. And uh, a guy working there with me. So Johnny and I, I knew Johnny, because Johnny helped me get my job at Legal Aid. Johnny and I knew each other, but we didn't know Gonzalo uh, very well. But what happens when you three work in a war on poverty, we had a lot of the same clients. Some people that went to see John also had a legal problem or lived in a neighborhood and needed a traffic light. So anyway, long story short, uh, we became a kind of referring people to each other and, uh, and uh, we became friends and we, we had lunch together almost every day. And uh, we, I tell this story because everybody thinks it's funny and we go have lunch every day, same place. Johnny Boy's Hamburgers on East First Street. We eat a hamburger, french fries, and a Dr. Pepper or something. And then after work, we all got together after work. Only this time we went, we, we can, we're off work now, so we go on to rabbits and um, drink beer, and talk to people. So one day we were sitting there talking and we were having a hard time getting our clients help sometimes because they were poor. And sometimes people, they, they have a hard time. They get to run around a lot. And we said, we were saying that, I don't even know who said it first. He said, you know what, there he said, you know the only way we're gonna help all these people we wanna help? He said, we have to get on the other side of that table. We're on this side, they're on that side. They're all elected and stuff like that. And we, if we didn't have them to deal with, we, if we were over there on the other side, wouldn't it be better? And we said, hell yes, it'd be better. So guess what? Out of that, those meetings every day, we decided that we were going to get some people together and, and we were going to run for those darn offices. And, and what made it so nice that we didn't have any problem, we didn't have any discussion about who should run for war, anything. John worked for the city, so he knew the city, so he said, I'm going to be in the city council. Well, I worked for legal aid and I, and I worked at the county courthouse a lot, and so I wanted to be a county commissioner. Of course, Gonzalo wanted to be a legislator. He wanted to pass bills and change the course of Texas. So we decided to run for office at some time. And we all ended up running. I ran first, Gonzalo ran second. He lost, he ran again, he won. Johnny won third, he, he lost, he ran again, he won. By 1976, we were all in office. And, uh, and that coalition, uh, the rest is history, but that coalition worked real well because we made a deal amongst ourselves that when he was on the city council and I was the county commissioner and I disagreed with something he was doing, nobody would ever know about it except he and I. You, we never took shots at each other. I didn't agree with everything John did. He didn't agree with everything I did, or Gonzalo. But you never, we never let the world know that because that, that's the key for them to knock us out. The divide and conquer theory works today, it worked a hundred years ago, and it'll work again. So, then to this day, we're the best of friends. And, um, and, uh, and somebody ought to write about that. You and Senator And, and I got the title, Up From the Barrio. <laughs> so all three of you keep in touch and- Oh yeah, well Gonzalo office is next door. We, I don't know why we have an office. None of us have jobs, but uh, we got an office because we we're gonna we're gonna do voter registration out of here, and uh, and if there's a candidate that, that we all three agree on, we're gonna let them if they want to work out of here and to work this part of town. Because what they do nowadays with campaigns, they have one headquarters and it's usually not in this part of town, and it's over there somewhere, and so we know. But we all have to agree on the candidate. It can't be 
Sometimes we don't always agree on who ought to be what, and that's okay, that's healthy, you know, uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as we don't go to the other party. <laughs> I don't think we're gonna do that. And um, Mr. Moyan, 1966 is when you took job as an investigator yep. at the Travis County Legal Aid Office. Mm -hmm. And you were in the Office of Economic Opportunity. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us like why because that's what led you to wanting to run for commissioner. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So why did that cause you to want to run? Well, because I think, and, and very briefly, I would say I could see that there's some, that the community that I grew up in and that I was part of, and I still am, uh, was having a hard time getting anything done. And 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 it, and they were taking advantage, and they, they still are. I mean, it's not it's not. I can't say it's all cured and everything's great and wonderful, because it isn't. But um, I feel that they needed representation, and if they had representation, they'd get a better shot, a better opportunity to get something done. I'm talking about little simple things too. I'm not talking about a big deal, but you know, and to this day, there's people in this part of town that still think that East Austin's getting the short end of the stick, and I agree. But if they'd been here 30 years ago, it would, that stick was a lot shorter. So it made some progress, but we don't need to stop working. But I, I think I think I did it because I thought that uh, that I could make a difference, and whether I did or not, somebody else would decide that. But uh, uh, and and I thought we needed people at the city, and the county, and the state to try to get it done. And uh, and uh, the main reason was to help uh, this part of town, really. Although I represent South Austin and as a commissioner in the rural areas too, and I can do that but not at the expense of this side. So you realize working at Legal Aid that a lot of stuff needed to get done. What kind of stuff? Legal okay. Aid? Mm -hmm. Well, we did a lot of routine civil stuff, you know, which divorcing, domestic, uh, child support stuff, um, some uh, real estate stuff. But um, we did one case uh, that kind of stood out to everybody that legal aid was here, I think, and that was when we were able to file a class action suit. A class action suit is real hard to do because judges don't want to mess with them. Uh, we got we filed a, a class action suit on home improvement fraud. Uh, well, there was a, a builder that was going around, had a, he was in cahoots with a finance company in Houston, and they were going around getting people Hell Somebody hit it with something? No. See anybody? <coughs> it might be the wind, I don't know. Is uh, it the branch or something? Yeah. yeah. Or a bird? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, or, oh, the home improvement deal. Well, we accidentally stumbled on this case because this guy came and talked to us about a case that he said he had this house that he thought he owned, and it turns out that he'd been evicted, foreclosed on. So we uh, we did some checking on it. I did some when and found out that what this guy had done, he had gotten a home improvement loan from this outfit, and they told him, we're gonna lend you $3,500, we're gonna fix your house, and uh, you can pay us back $100 a month or something. And, uh, and what happened was that, uh, they fixed the house. Um, well, I take it back. They did not fix the house. They got the loan, and then to get the money, the contractor had to show that he finished the house. And this, this, this is amazing. You're not going to believe this. They went and took a picture of another house. That was looked pretty good. <laughs> Said, "Here it is. We finished it," and they gave him the money. In the meantime, they marketed that guy's house the guys whose house never got fixed. And uh, he he was making the payments to the contractor, the contractor wasn't giving it to anybody except himself, and sooner or later they come and foreclosed. We had a hundred, and once the word got around about that deal, we ended up with 110 cases. We went to a judge to have a court of inquiry, our, our chief lawyer did, and he, they, he said, no, I don't want to mess with that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. So we went to the American statement and we said, here's what we got. We, and the lawyers went, I didn't do this. I went with them, but the lawyers didn't talk. 
We got this 110 people in East Austin have been victimized by this construction company, this finance company in Houston. And there, and but the judge, we only had one judge, two judge, Judge May Thurman. He he won't touch it. And he said, this is all a fraud. There's criminal cases here. They need to be put in jail or something. And uh, I didn't know what a court of inquiry was, but the lawyer explained it to him. So we went to, to one of the reporters in America State and the one to talk to Judge Thurman. I said, let me tell you something, Judge. He said, we got this deal from Legal Aid, and they want a court of inquiry to, so you can process, so we can prosecute these guys, and you're saying that you can't do it or you won't do it. So we just want to give you notice that tomorrow or the next day we're having a full-page article in American State about this fraud. And, um, and we're going to also have to say that you refuse to have a court of inquiry. He called him back about two hours later and said, okay, I'll call a court of inquiry. He called a court of inquiry. Now here's what a court of inquiry is. They take the facts. We, we're sitting there, the lawyer's sitting there. They present the case, case by case. They subpoena the contractor. They subpoena somebody from the finance company, uh, Mark, you know, whatever you call it. They take the testimony, and the judge, if he believes what you presented, this is amazing. Right there from the judge, he'll tell the sheriff, arrest that man. They take him right off the witness stand and put him in jail. Well, our, our legal aid became famous for that deal because it was one hell of a deal. I mean, those guys got indicted. One guy got indicted 110 times or something. Um, Anyway, the contractor, it took care of the deal. They had to settle those cases. They had to wipe out the loans. They, they, everybody was happy, uh, except that the contractor, so he skipped town. I don't think they caught him yet. We don't know where he went. <laughs> but anyway, it, it got taken care of. We weren't as interested in putting him in jail as we were in helping the clients out, so they wouldn't. They'd been victimized big time. Oh, they had the notary republic. The notary republic got indicted too, because what he was doing. Here comes uh, Janie Esparza to notarize that the job had been completed. And that's not Janie Esparza, it's some other lady. And he certified that it was Janie Esparza that signed it. So he was lying too, see. In order the public to require proof before they let you sign something. He wasn't requiring anything. He was a used car dealer here on East First Street that had a notary license. <laughs> I don't know what they were paying. They probably giving him $50 for her when he falsified or something. You probably figure, well, this will never get nowhere. They're just a bunch of poor people. Well, legal aid got it. So that was our big case. But we did a lot of stuff. We had things like, you know, like a, like a jewelry store who I won't name. When you didn't pay for the rings you bought or whatever, they would send you this letter that it would look like it came from, the, from a judge. Well, you can't do that. you got to send letters that look like your jewelry company. It scared people into, well, it, they owed the money. We weren't arguing that, but that wasn't the way to collect it. And uh, so it was a lot of little deals. There was a, there was a landlord over here in East Austin that rented houses, rented houses to people and if they didn't pay the rent, he had a key, he'd go in there and take something of value in lieu of the rent. Well, you can't do that either. So what did you do as an investigator? Well, like I, you know, mostly I, I did, I did the market. Like if I go check, uh, I'd go to the clerk's office and change the, I'd check the records on the purchases, transfers, see if they'd all been done right. Um, I'll, I'll, and I would, i most of it. They call it investigator. I call it a caseworker, but that's what lawyers wanted to call it. Um, I would round up the witness. I mean, I round up the clients, make sure they all showed up. At, Divorce Friday. I mean, I make sure they were there and, and, and line them all up. I mean, you know, there came a time we were doing 15, 20 divorces every Friday for a while. A lot of guys mad at me. I, I'm sure a lot of them didn't vote for me. <laughs> they didn't want to get, they didn't want to pay child support. That was the biggest, well, we helped with child support because the system there at the county was real slow. They had so many, we'd, we'd just skip them and go straight to the court with them on child support. You'd be amazed the reasons guys came for not, the reasons some guys gave for not paying their child support. But um, it didn't work, you just put to pay it. And uh, so, 
When you worked at the legal aid office, was that the first time you were exposed to the intricacies of county government? The what of county government? Just like the intricacies, like how county government works? No, well, you know, when I worked at legal aid, uh, I learned a lot about county government because I, we had an office there, and every time we needed something from the county commissioners, that's why I learned about county commissioners, uh, they, the lawyers would go, they would send me and uh, to, you know, Get a, get the copy machine fixed or get more paper. I mean, little rinky dink stuff that the county had agreed they would do for us in exchange. They also gave us a little office space in the courthouse, which worked out really well. I wish they had office space there now. They don't. You could just tell your clients, meet me at the courthouse in room 105 or something. You didn't have to. And it worked well, but it, it's all changed. It's all changed. I want to go back to um, your job as county commissioner, but before that, um, when you were, was it in high school when you were president of the National Junior League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC? Yeah, I was, I was in high school. Yeah, I was, uh, uh, at that time, you could only be in Junior LULAC till uh, you were 18. See, I was, in, I was, I was a senior probably in high school. Can we take a break? That's true. Oh, I'm, I'm You're okay. Are we good? So going back to LULAC, what did you do as the national president? Well, you know, that LULAC, uh, at the, the junior LULAC portion of LULAC at that time was, you know, more of a, uh, we actually didn't do a lot, of, a lot of civic stuff. It was almost a social group at that time. We were all young. We were all ages 16 to 18. And uh, we, um, what I, what I did a lot of when that one year, I, you can, I was only there one year, you can uh, form a lot of, well, the idea was to have a lot of organizations everywhere there was senior LULAC, try to form, to get the juniors, the younger kids to get involved uh, and do some projects. And, but most of them just wanted to <laughs> have fun, I think. And, uh, but it was more of a social organization. We had, you know, we had meetings and we had a national convention just like they did. We didn't have it at the same time they did. They wanted us to, but we were, we were more rebel than that. We said, we don't want to be with you old guys. I, I could say that then. I can't say it now. But uh, um, we, uh, some of the chapters did some social stuff. We did, here in Austin, we, we had a pretty big organization, and we uh, we would raise money. We'd have a, We'd make dances and raise money and give scholarships and stuff like that, but it, it, no, it wasn't a lot of stuff. You couldn't raise a lot of money. Those days you gave somebody a hundred dollar scholarship, you were doing really good, you know. Well now, you know, you need a heck of a lot more than a, even a thousand to do any good at all. And um, so that's mostly what we did. It's more social than anything else. We had a, at that time, uh, the band had just started up, and they would, it's still around, National Numbers, we used them all the time. And we had sock dances, and stuff. Mm. what kids do, you know, general stuff. Sock and, uh, dances? Pretty, you know, sock dances, where you wore socks instead of shoes. <laughs> Y'all don't do that. Y'all are too <laughs> modern now. Y'all wear shoes. <laughs> I guess we, some of us didn't have shoes. I don't know if that's the reason. So going back to um, your time as county commissioner, um, what was it like being the very first Mexican American serving? Um, uh, challenging. Um, it was not. It was that I was the first guy to show up over there that hadn't kind of been um, inbred, for lack of a better term. They was kind of handed to hand to the pass a baton, so to speak, and so I was here. I was the county commissioner from East Austin, um, uh, Mexican American. They never had had one of those. They knew because it was so fresh in their minds about the economy strike and the involvement there, and um, so they their opinion of me, I guess, was that. Um, I would think well, I was just going to be a troublemaker or something. 
And, and I had to agree. I, I kind of was. You know, I, I, I was. I mean, I, I rocked the boat a little bit, a lot. I think, I thought that, um, I think it was expected of me by the people that elected me not to maintain the status quo. I mean, they didn't want to do that. They might as well voted for the guy that was there. And uh, so um, I, I, I started asking a lot of questions. So uh, a lot of people didn't resent it to questions or resent it to having to answer them. They didn't think maybe they had to. Uh, and a lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't. And, and, uh, and I, I, I wanted to change things. I wanted uh, to uh, be more involved. My first meeting down there, Mr. Gall, the old time commissioner, had been forever. He's a grand old man, but he's super, super conservative. And, and as we got through with the meeting. I had a very short meeting, the first one of the year. And, and we, were in, we ended up in the elevator together. We're going down to the first floor. And he said, son, uh, let me give you some advice. I said, OK. My son, I was 37 years old. But you know, he was 110. No, he was 80 or something. <laughs> he was 80 or something. And he says, uh, let me give you some advice, son. I said, OK. He says, when you come to these meetings, come right before 10. You start to, and as soon as it's over, you get out of here and go back to your road and bridge office. We had an office out in the rural area. And I said, well, can I ask you why? And he said, yes, if you hang around here, somebody's going to ask you for something. This is a commissioner telling me that. I said, well, okay. And then he says, um, uh, and then what else did he say? Oh, the other thing he told me was, uh, well, first, oh yeah, and uh, you have an office over there with the auditor. Our office was one little office attached to the auditor's office. The auditor doesn't even work for the commissioners. He worked for the judges, but he took all our calls. We had no staff. We, we had no staff at the road and bridge office either. We, the superintendent of the road, the guy took care of the road to answer the phone. Didn't have anybody. Uh, he says, uh, um, Come to the office, but don't don't hang around here too much. Don't 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 hang around. I said okay. So I said this guy, that's got to be wrong. I mean that can't be right. So I come back and I said, uh, after been there about a year, I said you know I think we ought to have separate offices. We shouldn't be here with the auditor. I mean and he shouldn't be taking my call. And he says why? He said well because he doesn't need to know who's calling me. And he says, why not? I said, well, because he might be calling me to tell me we ought to fire him or something. I don't know. He just shouldn't be the one that answers. His secretary answered the phone and took my messages for me. I said, well, that's a heck of a deal. So it took some tug of war, but we finally got a little, we, not much, but we got private offices. Then I, then I came up, to, this is the thing that I ran up against what I'm telling you right now. It's, then, I, then I decided, me and Johnny Verduris, who was a young county commissioner, and he was not he helped me a lot my first term. He's the only one that helped me a lot. All the others always voted against me. Um, whatever I want to do, I said, well, uh, I'd like to have a, uh, create a position in my, uh, of administrative assistant to help me with my administrative duties. This little old man that told me not to hang around the court, and I said, well, are they going to do your job for you? I said, no, they're not going to do my job for me. They're going to help me do my job. Well. They had never had assistance. Well, they finally voted to let me and Johnny Maduris have one, but they didn't want me. So I said, okay, I don't want any, don't get any. So we, we so that's when we hired, uh, we, Johnny and I fired the first, the first women to ever work for a county commissioner. And you know who I hired? Margaret Gomez. It is a small world. Who's Margaret Gomez? Margaret Gomez is um, now it's a county commissioner in Precinct 4. Uh, she worked for me. Uh, actually, I hired her. Uh, I worked her during the economy strive. She was very active and very vocal and very detailed and helped with all the administrative stuff at the, at, at the economy strike. She's a very good friend of Dan Roy's. And, uh, so I said, well, I need somebody to know something about what's going on in East Austin. I didn't want nobody just to file folders and stuff. I mean, I need somebody to could go to meetings and when I couldn't go or go when I go in and, you know, that kind of stuff. I wanted to monitor. 
And, and of course now they all have assistants and they all have more than assistants, they have supporting staff now. And you have to watch it because sometimes the government things get too bureaucratic and they get too big. And uh, But uh, I, I just wanted a little help. So anyway, so we got, our, we got those assistants hired and then the others finally, David, some of the others, they finally all did it. They finally all did it. I knew they would. I mean, they find out that uh, it, some help to you. There's a lot to do there, but they didn't want to do anything but work on roads. And what they did, they let the auditor do everything. So finally I got in cross, crosswise with the auditor because I started wanting to do things that I knew were statutorily our duties. So finally I had to sit down with him and tell him, look, Bill, I don't want to do anything you're supposed to do. But likewise, I don't want you doing anything that I'm supposed to do. And if we can maintain that, we're going to get along fine. And, uh, but it was hard for him to give it up. For example, he, the auditor did the agenda. We didn't do it. He decided what we were going to talk about. So we said, well, that's wrong. The judge is supposed to do the agenda. And we're supposed to tell the judge what we want on the agenda, not the auditor who doesn't work for us, who work for the judges. You know, it's all convoluted or whatever you want to say. So anyway, little by little, the auditor and I respected each other, but we weren't on very good terms because he, he felt that I had taken away a lot of his duties, but they weren't his duties. They never were his duties, but so we wanted just to do what we wanted to do. All of, and then all of them got on, got on the same page and everybody agreed. So why did they want to work on roads? Because that's one of our duties, but, but it's not our only duty. And the, the roads, what you're supposed to do the road to hire a good road superintendent, and he does that. And you tell him what to do. And uh, But he doesn't, they wanted to be out there every day, and that's all they cared. And then they thought that was really their duty. They didn't want to be around the courthouse. And, uh, uh, but that's different now. It's all completely different. In fact, they don't, a lot of the communities don't even know where the roads are, you know, because they, 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 don't, they went to a unit road system where one guy takes care of all the roads for them. The commissioners don't take care of the individual roads, and there's pros and cons for that. I like the old way, but we I agreed to change to the new way because that's what it appeared like what the people wanted, yeah, that they wanted us to spend more. At this By this time, they want to spend more time at the courthouse. They don't want us out on the roads, which makes sense, really. So what were some of the other duties that you added? Well, the main duties of the county commissioner are is the budget process and the county decide just because you're elected countywide, that doesn't mean you can spend all the money you want. You you have to come to the commissioner's court and and tell them what you want to do, how many employees, you, new employees you want, and why, no equipment, and what have you. And the, so the county commissioners decide on that because the county commissioners have to decide on that because they're the ones that set the tax rate, and uh, that's another duty. The tax rate determines how much money we get in, so we can spend. And in, in county government, you can't spend more than you have which a lot of people think would be great if the U.S. government did it that way, but I'm not, I'm not arguing that point. But uh, so that's two duties. The other duty is the, uh, to provide the necessary tools for the criminal justice system, which includes uh, uh, funding the salaries of the judges and their support staff and their expenses. And, um, and the, one of the big, big, big duties of county commissioner is to maintain a safe and suitable jail and that's a very expensive venture uh, you know and take care of the roads that are not in the city in an incorporated city only those that are called county roads if they're in the city limits of Austin the city takes care of them um, and um, another responsibility that's kind of ignored a little bit by county government and that we're actually re responsible for the mentally ill. Now the state does a lot of that, but the county is supposed to make sure it works. So and, and it might mean put in money too, and they, they do, they do. They didn't put very much in way back there, but they do now. The other thing, and this to me was the most important role of county government, to me, indigent health care. Making sure that poor people have the, uh, the health care they need. Uh, very neglected in county government. Uh, very neglected in county government when I got there. And not so much later because we, we had the statute on our side. We, it, it's very clear that we're supposed to do it. Um, so now what happened with indigent health care, which I supported, is the creation of a health district 
which is now called Central Hills. Uh, the county is not directly responsible now because they've delegated to the health district. And the health district has taxing authority, so they can get what they need to a limit to take care of the poor. Then the city doesn't have to do it either. The city and the county, we used to do it together. The city didn't have to do it statutorily, but they did it anyway. And uh, 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 which was nice of them to do it because it took a little burden off the county. Uh, and the health care is the most important part of county government, I think. Uh, I, I had a meeting yesterday with one of the commissioners of Central Health, and I, and I told him this, and I don't really know him. He, he's an African-American guy, young guy, seemed very bright. I said, well, I said, I just want to give you one word of advice and you asked for this meeting, is that you need to remember one thing. Your main job is to take care of the poor. And as it relates to health. It had nothing to do with building big buildings and hiring staff and paying them a lot of money. Uh, it has to do with taking care of the poor people. I said, because if you don't, we end up paying part anyway because, you know, if you don't have any insurance and we didn't have health care, you know what I would tell you to do? Go to the emergency room. Guess who pays for that? Well, we do. So, you know, you, you pay one way or the other. Uh, we had a terrible indigent health care program when I got there, especially the, the, the food part. The, what they used to, when I got there, the, it was a super surplus commodities program. They denied people that needed it. You know, they just, would, they just didn't want to do it. And they treated them. The thing that bugged me the most was, uh, and I had experience with health care when I worked for legal aid because some of the problems poor people have is food. And, uh, they would have, they line them up like cattle over there on Pleasant Valley Road. And uh, and and the thing that peed me the most was when it was noontime, they just close and go eat. And if you were next in line, if you want to be next in line after lunch, you have to stay there for the hour because it could, when you, and if you left, when you came back, 100 people ahead of you. So now you're at the end of the line. I said, why can't y'all stay open? Well, we can't, we gotta go to lunch. I said, well, there's, Fifteen of you can, six of you go to lunch, and then when they come back, the other seven go to lunch. No, no, we can't do it. Well, I, I told the director, I said, well, tell you what, I'm just going to make a deal with you right now. If you don't change your policies, I'm going to start trying to figure a way to fire you. Just like that. I said, you can't fire me. I said, yeah, well, who hired you? He said, lost some boots. I said, well, I think I beat him. And he said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, we didn't fire him. We reorganized it, changed the hours, changed all the rules, and he quit. Worked out fine. I didn't want to fire him. I just wanted somebody else. <laughs> but he had that mentality, you know, that, uh, you know, and he make, they make real, real bad remarks to those poor people, you know. You know, they, they treat them bad. And they, they can't help it, they, they're poor. I mean, you shouldn't treat them like that. And, uh, but none of the commissioners had ever gone down there. None of them had ever gone down there. I said, why don't you all go down there? He said, you go down there? I said, yeah, I'll go down there. I'll go down there. I'll go down there today. I'll go with you. So then I, that guy from Waco knew what was trying to do, uh, indigent health care, where he called me up and he told me how he did it. I said, well, hell, that's a good idea. I don't have to wait in line. So I told Mr. Alexander, the one that ran Irish, he said, I'm going to go to Waco and see how they do it in Waco. He says, I'm not going to Waco. I said, yeah, you are going to Waco. He says, I said, uh, I'll get the commissioner to tell you to go to Waco. And so they said, yeah, go to Waco, man. I'm getting way off. I'm going to go to Waco. And he said, when we leave, and I said, nah, I'm going to my car. You go in yours. I'll meet you at Waco. So what, what they did in Waco was very simple. When people come for help, they come, they, the food they get, it depends how much they get, depends how many dependents they have. So they have one, they get, what, one, two, three, four. So what this guy in Waco did, he, he bagged it the night before. That's all. So when you go through a line and it's only you, back for one, there it is, see ya. Back for two, see ya. That's all it took. He didn't want to do it. He wanted him standing in line. So he, so he could make fun of him because if their hair wasn't combed, they, they weren't dressed right or something. And, uh, so they just didn't have any priority for that. So we hired a new guy and we told him and he was good because he worked at Carita. So he had he had an idea how it worked. Carita's the guy 
they supplemented the county. They helped the county with food and stuff um, for poor families. So we got a, that all straightened out. Uh, the caseworkers, a lot of them were just burned out. I said, we need to cross, cross train them, you know. Let them answer the phone sometimes instead of waiting. The hardest thing about being a caseworker is taking the application. And you know why it's, it's bad? Because some people lie. And they want to treat the ones that don't lie like the ones that lie. And, and, and see, that's wrong. I, I don't think anybody ought to get food stamps that doesn't deserve them. But I think everybody that does deserve them ought to get them. And it's hard for some people to make that. They just decide they're walking in. Uh, she's ineligible. I mean, that's the way they thought. Anyway, there was a lot of problems down at the county. That's the first four years. That's the first four years with nothing but straining out, straining out problems the way they treated the poor. The other thing when I worked legal aid, a lot of people didn't have the money to file a, to pay the filing fee, and we couldn't pay for them legally. And so, so I went and talked to the judge about there's a system in place called a pauper so and if you sign a, an affidavit that you're poor and can't afford to pay the filing fee, they let you file without paying the filing fee. Okay? So this judge, this judge, county judge, who I ended up working under later, he said, we can't do that. I said, yes, you can. It's the law. The statute says you can do it. He said, you'll love this, Maggie. He says, well, let me tell you something I learned a long time ago. This is judge. He says, if you want to, if you want to dance, you got to pay the fiddler. That was a strategy for not pay, for making them pay a filing fee. <laughs> I said, well, none of these dance, so you need to let them pay. Well, they finally agreed, and, and here's how they agreed. The judge agreed they could file a pauper's fee if we said they were eligible, but they would bill us for it every month. But here's the deal. You'll love this part. But you don't have to pay it. But I can show my people that I tried. <laughs> okay, I play that game. That's a good game. Did you have a special compassion, or do you think you had a special compassion for the poor? Because Absolutely. Of your own background. Well, partly, but I, I just, I, I just, I just have seen it, where they just get mistreated, and uh, and and uh, I still have it. I mean, I watch these TV programs about all this programs they want to cut out and all that stuff and uh, it's just beyond me how people can can feel that way uh, they, they got theirs I always quote people in the old high tire quotation and when I worked for high tire for a while remember I told you I worked for him for a while he had a quote about about uh, he had two quotes about poor people he said that ultra conservatives don't want to help the poor and the reason they do it is because they believe this way they believe it's they, they like to tell the poor, I got mine, you get yours. Adios, chump. That's what he would say. And think about it, that's pretty good. And the other saying he would have, and uh, that I use sometimes, it says that all I want to do, I want to take the jelly from the top shelf and put it in the bottom shelf so the little guy can get it. That's it. That's in a, in a, in a funny way, that's the way I feel. And, and I believe it. I believe it, and people think I don't believe it. I believe it, and 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 I and I, and, I, and that's what I tell everybody. You know, I, I never forgot where I came from. I mean, I get up every morning, and I go to East Austin and drink coffee. I don't drink coffee out there, Shady Hollow, where I live. I live there. I sleep there. I live in Prison Four, and 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 everybody will tell you I'm probably the only Hispanic elected official that does that. And I'm not saying they forgot where they came from. It's just not as convenient. But you know, I'm there. You can find me, Maggie, any morning. One in a million, Joe's Bakery, Los Huaraches. Los Huaraches is good food. It's a plug in your deal for the Huaraches, and it's cheap. <laughs> what do you think was your biggest accomplishment as county commissioner? Well, helping the poor. I mean, it, it, I, mean I, I think if you could find the article that the interview I gave when I got beat the day after, it'll tell you that. It, it kind of explains that because one of, one of the things that, I, that I'm the proudest of is in helping the poor was that I convinced the county commissioner's court that
that out of their budget, out of their dollars, out of their taxpayers' dollars, they ought to help nonprofits that are helping the poor, because those nonprofits can help the poor with more compassion and for less money to be realized about it. Because people that work in these places that help the poor, they ain't doing it for the money. I'm telling you that right now. Those guys with those titles, executive directors, they don't make very much money for being executive directors. So and when I got there, they didn't give money to anybody except they gave $10,000 to MHMR. And now, now, and the city does it too. They give millions. They give millions of dollars. Uh, and uh, we, we got them started to do that. And, uh, and, and they've continued to do it. And I'm proud of them. And they increase the funding when it's necessary. And, uh, and they fund those kind of programs that need funding. And, um, you know, the, the thought was, when I first got there for the commissioners was, we can't help anybody unless they're county employees. You know, in other words, you can't help an agency. MHMR because somebody showed him the statute. My first year in office, I made a motion to give $25,000 to MHMR instead of 10. The judge, the county judge, walked out of the meeting. And, <laughs> and on the way out, he ran, to, ran into a good friend of mine, the county attorney, Ned Granger, at that time, a good friend of mine, helped me get elected. Um, Ned Granger tells a story that he ran to Judge Watson. Watson was fuming. And he ran into him and he says, Hey, Granger, you want some money? And he said, Sure. He said, Well, go in there. Moya's giving it all away. <laughs> $25,000 to MHR. I bet they give millions now. I bet you. And they should. And other programs. Well, you know, we try to help a program, um, and, they, and they did it, uh, a program run by Cisto Ramirez that was helping inmates, uh, uh, felons that are released. And they come back to those safe house, halfway houses, and they stay there, they sleep there, and they go look for jobs when they get jobs to get out of there. And uh, he got some funding from the state, but he didn't have enough. And so he came to us to get a, 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 some money. Of course, they, they couldn't understand it, but we, we got it done. And we gave him $25,000, $30,000 every year, all the 15 years I was there. Uh, and it was a good program. They came to realize that it was good. I'll tell you another program that I got started, and, and um, Oh man, this was really hard to get done. Got somebody, before Richard Helpham became famous with uh, American Institute for Learning or whatever it is he has now, he, we gave him a $12,000 grant to teach GED classes to inmates. <laughs> Those guys like to die. What? I said, yeah, but why do you want to do that? I said, what, so when they get out of jail, they can get a job because they, they have a high school diploma and that don't, then they won't be back in jail maybe. I said, well, how many of those? I said, I don't care if it just saves two. That's two more we got, that's two more spaces we got for the real bad guys. So, and they did that and uh, of course they figured a way to get him out of there. They fired him because he did something, gave somebody a cigarette or something, I don't know. Anyway, a lot of those programs uh, uh, I started uh, and, and uh, they're still there. Did you run for a fifth term? Or did you step? No, I no, I lost. I lost. I lost uh, my fifth time around by 300 votes um, because I um, I upset the environmentalists, and uh, I had always been kind of a friend of theirs. But I could see the traffic problems that we were having here in Austin, and I voted on a, on a board I was on there. Transportation Study Committee. I voted uh, to to uh, to expand uh, 183 and Ben White, which they've done, and which even now needs to be expanded again. I voted for that, and to the environmental liberals, that was that was a cardinal sin, and uh, they will get you for that. And then I did one other thing, and they were already mad at me. I said, well, there's something else we need in Austin, and I'm going to propose it. So I did, and that really made them mad. So they, I proposed that we do a feasibility study about the possibility of Austin having an outer loop. And the only way you can have an outer loop in Austin, Texas, you have to cross the aquifer. There's no other way. And they don't want anything in the aquifer. They opposed Della Mae Moore because she, was, she voted to buy a piece of land to build 
a community college over the aquifer. We beat them back anyway. But we had to cut deals with Republicans and everybody we could shake at, and but we won. We beat Bill Spillman, who we beat um, for school board. Uh, so anyway, I think I was right. And if I had to do it again, I'd do it again. I mean, it, there's no doubt in my mind that, that Ben White in 183, if any of you guys ever get on it, that would cannot argue that we didn't need to do that. Now, I, I know about the environment and I'm sensitive to it, but uh, there's some things that is really not true that if you don't build it, they won't come. That, that's just BS. And they, their theory is don't build it because they'll come. But they're coming anyway. Austin's grown. God almighty, it's grown since I was born. Um, before we run out of time, I do want to get to the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Um, do you remember when the Voting Rights Act was passed? Like, do you remember how you felt? Wait, or... Siren. Repeat the question? Or just to the no, to the siren. No, should I repeat? Yeah. yeah okay. I'll turn. So, um, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, do you remember what was going through your mind? What emotions? Yeah. Sure, I do. Uh, that, was, that was a very important piece of legislation. Um, it was a um, hard fought thing. Um, when it finally passed, uh, the thing I remember about it, and this is something that a lot of historians probably don't remember about this, but, and, and I love the man, but he voted against it, Henry B. Gonzalez. Henry B. Gonzalez, who I thought, I used to go when I was a young man, sit in the gallery in the Senate, just to hear him talk about legislation. He was, he was that impressive to me, to me. And I, my, I even as a young man supported him to run for governor or something. We met at Arch DeWitty's house, which is a, a very prominent black uh, uh, leader here at that time, up there on these tents or somewhere. But then I was completely shocked by that vote. As I think a lot of people, I don't know how many people know about it, but I'll tell you who the hero was on that voting rights act from Texas was Robert Jordan. Robert Jordan was a hero. And uh, uh, the voting rights act, uh, was the most needed thing around southern states that you've ever seen. They had some of the silliest rules to keep you from voting. They were worse in, in the real southern states like Alabama and Mississippi. Somebody told me that, that one, of the one of the things that required an African-American person from getting uh, the right to vote was to answer one question. And here's the question. How many bubbles in a bar of soap? Uh-huh. You would fail it, wouldn't you? Well, they asked silly questions like that of, of African Americans. They didn't ask them that of Anglos. Here, here was pure intimidation. Here, here they just did it by intimidation, uh, and uh, they do it now. This deal is going on right now. This is just ridiculous. I mean, I don't know that what's going to happen to that ID law, but you know, when my wife goes to vote with me and they make her sign an affidavit because. Her driver's license says Margaret, I mean Gertrude G. Moya, and her uh, voter registration says Gertrude Garza Moya. She has to sign an affidavit that she's the same person. Well, that's crazy. And, and, and women, a lot of women, when they get divorced, they don't change everything. They change their driver's license because it's against the law after six months. If you don't change it, they give you a ticket or something, or if you move. And and this guy, where we went, we went to Fiesta Food there on Stassi Lane. He was very nice, very polite about it. He re filled out another registration card. Now they're going to mail her another that's going to correspond with her driver's license. So the next time she goes to vote, well, what if this has been a presidential election and you had a line two block law? That's ridiculous. I mean, I don't know if they meant to do that, but they're in it now, buddy. And 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 I and there's no voter fraud in Texas to to change the outcome of any election ever. I mean, they, it, it, there is, and there's no proof. There's no proof. I think they prosecuted four people. Right? And I don't know any any election that was won or lost by four votes in any any place. So anyway. No, I, I think the Voter Rights Act was very important legislation. Um, 
We needed it. We still need it. We still need it. But you know what I think they ought to do? They, make, they ought to make it for all the states. The thing that they singled out the South because they were the worst violators in a few, a few other states was because they were, they were flagrant, flagrantly violating it. Uh, Gonzalo and I had a terrible argument with Mark White about this voter rights act. Because when he became Secretary of State, he wanted to go up there and said, we don't need it anymore. That's true. I was true a long time ago. I said, no, it's true now. He said, we need to be able to vote. I mean, we need to feel comfortable voting. What a lot of older Mexican-Americans do, they're intimidated by all these rules, and they don't go. That's not, they, well, they don't vote because they're afraid to vote. I wish we had enough money to get everybody to vote by mail, man. Because <laughs> they can't check your ID on mail. See, they, they can't do it on mail. You vote, then. That's, if there's going to be any fraud, that's where it's going to be. Did your parents vote? After yes, ma'am. They vote. My parents always voted, and my mother was born in Mexico, and, and like a lot of people of her age, was fairly conservative. And I think we admit that, that our folks are like that. Uh, some of them. The biggest shock of my life with my mother, uh, which I, I didn't think she'd ever do it, during the economy strike, she marched. My mother would tell you how bad marches were since I was a little boy. I mean, marches were just kind of a terrible thing to do. And and so we got so involved in that thing that my dad and her marched arm in arm down Congress Avenue. I said, well, we've done some good here. Because she was, you know, she was just conservative. And I mean, she, she probably thought half of the stuff I did was crazy, man, but she, she still supported me. Did they pay the poll tax? Yeah, sure. I even I think I even did that. So. Yeah, we used to have to have poll tax dances. We had dances. Lulac used to make these dances that if you pay if you paid your poll tax there at the front door, you get them to dance free. <laughs> and you know when you think about it, that was probably illegal. Because. Because now if you pay somebody, if you say, if, if you go vote, they stand people at polling place, they told us to stop doing that. You stand at polling place, if you go vote, don't tell them how to vote, just tell them you go vote, here's a ticket, you can get a free hamburger or, or free empanada at Joe's Baker or something. You can do that. Anyway, you shouldn't have to do that anyway. How do you think um, Mexican Americans have been affected by the Voting Rights Act? By the what? By the Voting Rights Act. Sure they are. Sure they are. I mean, you know, uh, first of all, it was uphill battle to get them to go vote. Initially, people, uh, I'm old enough to remember this, a lot of people, when I ran for office, a lot of people said, would tell you, well, no, I don't need to vote. It's, um, my vote don't count anyway. I said, what do you mean your vote don't count? They don't count our votes. Or out there in the rural area, I went and talked to some guy who worked out there in a, on a farm, and I said, you know, don't forget to vote. And I knew him, and he, he, he says, uh, don't forget to go vote. If you need a ride, I'll, you know, let me know. I'll give you. I'll get you a ride, or I'll take you or something. We'll get you there. He said. Uh, he said, uh, "No, I don't vote. My boss votes for me." Well, I said, I would, "He really believed that." So I've heard a lot of stories that drive you to thinking, but just the mere idea. First of all, way back there, they. they before I ran, and even maybe after, but before I ran, a lot of people didn't vote because they knew, guess what, that we couldn't win. Why go vote? He, he, that guy's not going to win. He's Hispanic. Hispanics don't win. I mean, talking to Austin and the Valley, you know, you might say Anglos can't win, but... Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, intimidation is, and it's still a big factor. People don't, people are afraid of the unknown, and uh, and going to vote to some people, it, it, it's a deal, it's a bad deal. One of the things I did when I, you know, commissioner's court appointed judges for general election. Democratic and Republican primaries, they do it, and they usually appoint their priests and chairs to do it. We as commissioners don't have to appoint the priests and chairs if we don't want to. Uh, so you appoint people. If you do a good job, you look into it real carefully, and I made sure that in my district, I didn't worry about those other guys because that's their job, but in my district, I made sure that we had Hispanic workers at every precinct. 
and if possible, if he's an election judge or the assistant judge, be a, be a, a Spanish-speaking Hispanic because it helps. It helps a lot. Uh, they feel better when they go vote. Says, "Well, who's there?" But está la señora can say, "Well, everybody knows that lady. You know, she's community activist." Oh yeah, well, I'm gonna go. Say, "Well, who is there?" Puro gringo, well, you know. They, they. I mean, I'm sorry to say they, that that does affect them. To answer your question, short answer, yeah, yeah, we we need it. All the help we can get, and they need to not stop putting obstacles in the way. Any kind of obstacle. I heard some gals there, Joe Baker, say, "Oh, man." I've been divorced twice. I don't even know what my name is on my driver's license. <laughs> now, in Austin, at least where I went, I can't complain because they were really nice about it. I'm not sure that that's the way it is everywhere. It may be some place at Randall's out there in the corner of Slaughter and Brody. They might be treating them differently. So. Did you lose faith in Henry V after the Voting Rights Act. Did I what? Did you lose faith in him, Henry B. after the Voting Rights Act? Well, I'm not sure I did. I was just, I think I was disappointed and I didn't understand why. And to this day, I don't understand why. And I don't know how to find out why now. I mean, I guess I could ask the other Gonzalez guy. But uh, is that his son or his nephew? It's his son, Carlos. I never understood why. And, and I, I, one thing I found out that most people don't know it. Don't know that he voted against it. But, and I don't know how in the devil I find out. I guess somebody made an issue of it. Maybe I read in a San Antonio paper or something that he voted against it. And I don't remember to, he might have tried to explain it away, but I don't remember. Uh, but I, I was very disappointed in him because that, that's completely, to me, that was completely out of character. You know, I would have thought he'd been there standing with Barbara Jordan waving the flag, you know. But, uh, no. How much did Mexican-Americans know about the Voting Rights Act when it was passed? Know about what? The Voting Rights Act. Like oh, I don't know that they know too much about it. Uh, I think, you know, I think that's why... I, our elected officials should make it a point to educate them on that kind of stuff and tell them about it uh, because they, they're, they're kind of counting on you. A lot of people just say, well, you know, he's up there, he'll, he'll do us. it. You know, it's just like, uh, I'll, I'll tell this joke about Gonzalo. It just happened the day before yesterday. When, you know what, what Gonzalo did? To, his, he did one of his big accomplishments, whether people know it or not, is constituency service. He did more constituency service than all those other senators put together. And they can count it up, and I bet I'm right. Uh, and I know because when, when he left office, three months before he left office, he hired me to do his archives. And I did them, and it took me three months. And it took me one-third of the boxes I box were cases about him helping people, not the people in the penitentiary necessarily, but people of, of parents and husbands and cousins and brothers of those that are in the penitentiary, helping them with something. He did more of that than anybody I know. And and I checked with Yolanda, who stayed on after. Kirk Watson ain't doing any of it. So there you go. So then, here's the joke. They, on Halloween night, on Halloween day, at Joe's Bakery, traditionally the waitress dress up like something. You know, they dress in costumes. That, they've been doing it forever. One of the girls there, named Maggie, uh, dressed like an inmate, top and bottom, like inmate uniform. Okay, the next day we go to Joe's Bakery, and of course they're not dressed anymore, they're dressed in their regular clothes. And one of the guys sitting with me tells Maggie, oh, you got out of prison. And she said, yeah, I called him Talabarentos. Isn't that great? I told Gonzalo that yesterday. And he thought, I said, now, see what I'm They know. They know. And, and that's, that's, I'm going to tell that story every chance I get because that is classic. You know what i And uh, so he would get, uh, he would write letters. He would do, you know, some people, some mothers, you know, God, these guys commit, they get put in penitentiaries, cause more heartbreak to their mothers than they can ever imagine. They worry about them every day. And then the inmates, without thinking about it, write a letter to their mother and tell them, 
they didn't give me my medicine yesterday. They pick up the phone and call Gonzalo Barrientos. Actually, they still call him and say, my son, blah, 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 he didn't get his medicine, and here's his prison number, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he write a letter, you know, or call or something. Um, they don't realize that when they write a letter like that to their mom, their mom's going to worry to death. You know, yeah, I'm assuming they didn't give it to them, but, you know, mom can't do much about it, but worry. And worry, they can, they can worry. I've known, uh, you know, I didn't do that kind of stuff. I, we wrote a few letters, he and I wrote a few letters for people that were getting out, and all we could do on those things is tell them we knew the parents, we knew that they had a job at Miller Blueprint, we had talked to the manager, and they're, that's the main thing they want to know when you're getting out. Do you have a place to stay, and do you have a job? And if we knew that, we would write those letters. Well, we finally wrote a letter for a guy, had a place to stay, had a job. He went out there and killed somebody. And their parents, to this day, blame Gonzalo and I, because if we hadn't written those letters, he wouldn't have got out, he wouldn't kill her daughter, baby Lou. You heard it, her old Mesa case. Well, you heard it now. Um, well, we try to explain, and we get the parole board to tell you, we don't care about those letters. All we care that they have a job. I mean, you can get a letter from Obama, and and if he doesn't have a job and a place to stay, they ain't gonna let him out. So anyway, but uh, those are the. So we kind of slowed down doing that because you know, the, you know the, and this guy went everywhere. And I ran for re-election. He went to every forum that I was at and tell his story. Yeah. We're still on the same set again. We're on. No, we're on our fifth color. Oh, okay. So anyway, it's aside from this interview, but it's kind of interesting that that, that stuff goes on. Um, how do you think people have misunderstood the Voting Rights Act? How do you do it? People have misunderstood the Voting Rights. Well, they don't know. It, now, I don't think a lot of people know it's there. I don't know. They don't. I don't think they know there's things there to protect them. Um, they just get used to voting now. They're voting a little bit better, although they're beginning to slack off again. Uh, uh, I don't really know why, but uh, I don't think they're aware of it like you are or like I am, uh, Maggie is, and everybody that keeps up with this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think they understand it. I don't think, I don't think half the people that are going to lose their food stamps this next week know they're going to lose them till they lose them. They, 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 they just don't know. Um, they'll know when they tell them or when they go up to when they don't get them in the mail, or however they do it, their little cards. I don't know how they do it. Um, they're not. They're not that that up. They're not up to up to date. Uh, it, you. Uh, it's not that they're. It's just. It's not in their day to day living thing they do every day. Read the newspapers, uh, and and they're not the only ones. There's a lot of people. You know. You think you go down there and you go to uh, West Austin and knock on 10 houses and tell them to name you their two senators and their congressmen. And I bet you half of them can't do it. I mean, they can't do it all. I bet they can't. They can't do it. I mean, it's just, that's what I told my mother when I got her ready to take her test. I said, well, you know more about government than I do. I mean, you, I mean, they have hard questions. Like, you know, and in Austin, how in the hell do you know who your congressman is? They change it every two years. <laughs> they change the lines. You have always been a Democrat. You've always aligned yourself with the Democrat always. Party. Always. Um, how have your political views changed over the years, if at all? Well, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, I, I just don't think that the, the Republican viewpoint or platform has, has anything to do with helping people less fortunate than them. I don't think they care. Uh, or if they don't, they, they, they're so, so hell-bent and cutting out everything to shorten the amount of money they pay in income tax, that they'll cut out any, any program that doesn't affect them directly. You know, they're against, I use this example, they're against jails till their son gets put in jail. Then they want fair treatment. Before that, they don't care what they do to them. They're a bunch of poor people and drink too much. They're always drunk. But put one of them in jail, and they, they kind of change it. They, they're not exposed to it, so they don't care. 
Uh, Democrats, not all of them, and Democrats not a perfect party. Don't get me wrong, they, but it's better than than the other choice, and uh, and and not all Democrats think like I do, and 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 not all Republicans think like Ted Cruz, but the majority think a little bit like Ted Cruz. In fact, I don't think anybody thinks like Ted Cruz, but Ted Cruz. But 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 that's just my opinion. Um, what accomplishments has the Democratic Party made for Mexican Americans? Well, jobs. I think the, the one of the main things that they they tried real hard to create jobs, and and um, and job programs. Let me tell you, job programs are very important. Um, our people can do a lot of things. Uh, his, and Mexican Americans are are really good with their hands. They're very crafty. I'm excluded from that list, but the majority of them are. And, and they can do anything with a little bit of training. And, and, and those job training programs, going way back to the Warm Priority Program, CETA and, and other programs, have helped those people if they take advantage of them. It's training people for jobs and, and, and providing jobs. And, and, equal, and fair, fair employment laws have helped. Uh, some of these people do it because they have to do it. Some of these people do it because they can't get the contract if they don't do it, uh, and uh, and they want the contract because there's a lot of profit in them. Uh, housing, they try to help with housing. HUD is alive because of, of uh, Democrats. If, if Democrat, if the Republican had their way, they'd wipe out HUD tomorrow, and say, you know, everybody take care of themselves. And uh, um, so there's a lot of programs. Uh, that help a lot of people, but they do help uh, Hispanic. Uh, you know, I try to tell this friend of mine that, that he's, he thinks he's a Republican, but you know, I don't think he knows what he's saying. But uh, uh, I said, uh, "Do you have Medicare?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "You have a uh, Social Security?" "Yeah." Who do you think got you all that? He said, the "Republicans didn't want Social Security." The, the problem that Republicans have with Social Security now is that they can't kill it. Once the program gets going, they can't kill it. They can't kill Medicare. If they let Obamacare stay in existence three years, they won't be able to kill that either. Those are the people's programs. And that's where they help. If you talk about people, that's where we are. We're, we're the little people. And we need all the help we can get. Our people need help, and we need to help them. Where, well, we're in a position to help them. We ought to help them. And, and, uh, and our young people need to um, get involved. I, I, I see a little, I, I may be imagining this, but I see our younger people um, kind of getting away from government a little bit. And sometimes success uh, breeds uh, success, for not knowing how, how to say it any better. Um, we need more young people to get involved in public office. And and they, and and, it, and, they, and they better and they better not think they're doing it for the money because that's not that's not going to work. They're not going to do it. For, they're not going to get rich being a public official. So you want to get rich, you better become a professional petroleum engineer or something, and and get hired by some big firm. And and we need that. I'm not against that, especially if they don't forget where they came from. Speaking of these younger generations, how do you think they view advancements towards their own race? Well, I think that it, I don't know. I couldn't answer that uh, because I don't have no real proof, but I think, I think a lot of our folks for forgetting where they came from. That's the, fr that's the phrase I use. That's the nicest way I can say it. Um, uh, success sometimes, you know, have you noticed that, that, uh, all right, have you, have you all, any of y'all noticed that people have become real successful in minorities? Uh, become millionaires and billionaires on it, that a lot of them become Republicans? Why is that? I got mine, you got yours, you get yours. There's only one billionaire I know that hadn't had forgotten where he came from. Alonso Cantu from the Valley. He had not forgotten where he came from and he is rich. He is the richest man I've ever seen shook hands with. Of course, I have never shook hands with a lot of rich guys either, but, but he, he helps. And he, you don't know he helps. 
he's helped me, and I know he's helped, but nobody knows he's done it because he, he doesn't do it for the publicity. He does it because it's the right thing to do. And he, he and uh, somebody told me, well, so what, you know, he, I said, let me tell you something about Alonso Cantu. He's the only Hispanic I know that has Hillary Clinton's cell number. You know anybody has Hillary Clinton's cell number? Well, I don't. And I know a lot of Democrats, they don't have her cell number. <laughs> he does. Um, a lot of Mexican Americans have been critical of the Democratic Party for offering lip service just to garner votes. And um, what are your thoughts on that? Let me tell you something about that. Uh, it's all interpretation. I've always said that you can negotiate anything to a point without selling out. You can negotiate something you believe real strongly in a little bit. It's, that means you get you get the job done or partially get it done. You don't have to get everything you ask for. Too many of our people want the whole thing, and if they don't get the whole thing, you're a failure. Well, I don't agree with that. And 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 if that means I'm not liberal enough, then I'm not liberal enough. But if I can compromise enough to get part of it, like I used that example about the human resource manager. I didn't think I won a, the personnel director was a big victory, but I opened the door and I figured that by doing that, I'd get what I wanted eventually, and I did. Sometimes you have to compromise a little bit to get what you want, but there's a lot of people that think that unless you go all the way, then the Democratic Party or whoever they're talking about sold out. You don't sell out unless you sell out, and, and you can compromise and not selling out. Uh, going too far. If Obama agreed to eliminate Obamacare, he sold out. If he agrees to make a few changes in it, it doesn't affect a lot of people, that's okay to me. But some people don't agree with me on this. And you go down here and talk to someone, and I know who they are, uh, that they'll, they'll say, no, no, man, you sold out. How do you feel personally about being called a role model by younger generations, or not even just people your own age? Uh, I take it very seriously, and and and, and I and I think about it all the time. Uh, not as much now because I'm not I'm not in the limelight. But I always used to think that uh, that uh, they kind of judge all of us Mexicans well, when I first got elected by what I do, and that's not fair. But that's what they're going to do. So you got to be you got to be mindful of that every day when you get up in the morning, and don't do something stupid. Uh, that they're going to think that all all people that look like you are stupid too. So I think you know you got to be uh, aware of that, and uh, and you got to just think everything out. Don't don't do anything real, you know, without thinking about it. And you need to think about how it's going to affect other people, not just you. Hey, you might say I don't give a damn, you know, if they if they find out I did that. Well, you need to give a damn because. Uh, they're going to judge you, and I and I I've been quoted early on. I remember getting quoted that I I felt that the success of other Hispanic getting elected to public office was going to depend on on how I was perceived. Now I'm not perceived very well today, but when I first got elected, but I'm going to have to do something that that it doesn't hurt your chances of getting elected, or your chances or your chances, because they'll do that to you. People will do that to you. If I had gotten, you know, gotten, gotten in trouble, criminal trouble, and said, oh, no, he'll just do it the way I did. That's not fair, but that, life's not fair. And so uh, once you're aware of that, and, uh, and the other thing you've got to be aware in public life, perception is more truthful than the truth. People believe what they want to believe, and they don't care if you prove it otherwise. Uh, and so you got to, perception will kill you, man. So you gotta, you got to be aware of that. And that's it. Go ahead. What do you want people to remember you for? Uh, helping poor people. The biggest accomplishment, I think, was uh, the funding of social services. Agencies that do things for, for, some people don't want to help these people. Uh, and they, these agencies that we have out there, and there's lots of them. Some of them are better than others. Maybe some of them should be not, not funded. 
but I, I'm not going to defund one, and I'm not going to defund all of them because one of them didn't, somebody stole some money, and we read about some. There are some problems with some of them, but uh, I think that overall, they do a good job. You know, I think funding the people free clinic, God almighty, they didn't want to do that. You know, a bunch of hippies have a clinic, man. What are you doing? Why are you a hippie? No, I'm not a hippie, but they help, they help people like some of my constituents get help from them, and I want to help them. And they, they help them because y'all want to help them. And, and, uh, but they have a built-in deal. Legal aid? Legal aid not doing near the job they used to do. I don't know why. I am bothered to find out, but uh, they, I should. But uh, legal aid helping poor people, you know, uh, get divorces. Why are the government doing that? I said, you, you guys don't even understand helping poor people in civil cases. You should be proud to do it. We're required by law to help poor criminals. By law, you have to provide lawyers to criminals. I'm not against it, but I mean, if, if you're going to be if you're going to be an ultra conservative, you ought to be against that, right? Yeah, but well, do you know that we help you if you commit a crime, and you don't have any money, hire a lawyer. We, the county, will hire your lawyer. And if you find guilty of murder and you don't have any money, we'll appeal it for you. Mr. Moy, I just want to thank you again for all well, of your help. Do you don't want to go longer? That we can postpone the Longhorn game. <laughs> just ask why he's wearing a Texas football. Oh, why are you wearing a Texas football shirt? Well, I'm a Texas football fan. I tell everybody that I, I tell everybody here lately because Renee Ramirez got inducted into Hall of, Hall of Honor last night. I said, my wife and I were probably the only Mexican in Memorial Stadium when he ran that ball for a touchdown. You know nobody had heard of Renee Ramirez, number 46. We were sitting up there in the stands, they were playing rice, and they put this guy in. Number 46, who is that? Looking for Renee Ramirez from Hamptonville, Texas. Yeah. Well, they, they, they kicked a the chart. Is that a deep? I guess they went to kick it to Renee Ramirez, huh? Well, he caught him running for a third time. That, that started the name, the Galloping Gaucho. And and uh, they kept, they called it. The way I'm, I went and met him, and I told him, look, man, I've got a softball team. I want you to play on it. Because, you know, it, it impressed those guys. And he did. He played for my softball team. And old, old Renee was such a big guy, and he would either strike out or hit a home run. Nothing in between. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I wanted to um, ask if there's anything else you'd like to add. I was trying to like tie it up because you no, said no, you no, I know, and I appreciate that. Oh no, I could go forever, you know, but we don't need to do that. You said you wanted to get to the game, so yeah. Well, I'm gonna watch it at home, but uh, mm -hmm. I used to go to every game, but I, I, I'm too old now. It's hard climbing up those stairs. Those kids run over you now if you don't get out of the way, and. Uh, so we, we stay home and, and, and watch it now. But I used to, I was telling her, I, I've been going to Longhorn games since I was about 10 years old. And uh, I would tell her, uh, they used to have, they didn't have packed stadiums then. They had, uh, they give you tickets at, at school. Not hold, they call it not hold gang. A little card had your name on it, what school you went to, what grade you were in. And on the side here, it had all the home games. So when you went to the game, they punch a hole in that so you wouldn't, Give it to somebody else to use it, I guess. And we sit in the end zone. And uh, and uh, I'd go to every one of them. And then we found out we'd go real early, like five in the morning. And they would hire us to ice down the soda waters because in those days they sold the soda waters in bottles. They didn't have those carbonated drinks like they do now. And ice down boxes, all kinds of boxes, 50 cents an hour. And uh, so we'd do that till 12. But all the games were at 2 o'clock then. All of them. Um, and at, from 12 to 2, we'd all go out in the infield with a long, the, the teams were getting ready to play. They would let us get on the infield. I mean, in the end zone, I'm sorry, the end zone. And we'd play football. We thought we were Longhorns. That's what I used to do every Saturday. 